So, welcome to the virtual Board of Finance special meeting. It's a special meeting because we moved the date, but it, it, it continues our budget deliberations. I'm going to call this meeting to order. If you're in the public, if you call to listen, you will not be heard by the board members and there will be no live public comment. The public is encouraged to send their comments before or after the meeting to the following email, bof at fairfieldct.org. So this is Chairman Brown. This meeting is now in order. I'm going to waive the pledge because we said the pledge already tonight and move forward into this meeting. So continued budget deliberations with certain departments. We did receive backup and documents from our last meeting and also um, documents from the finance department with the collection rates, uh, non-tax revenue adjusted for COVID-19. Okay, and it's We've discussed in past meetings, suggested Board of Finance expense adjustments, again, from our finance department. We also received a document as requested from the ECC on a delayed opening budget impact analysis. And we did receive documents from the Fairfield Police Department with their department vehicle list. Uh, and other documents relating to our insurance, health insurance, tax appeal legal expense, and part-time monthly net savings. So we're going to start with talking to and getting updates on the department heads, certain department heads, and these department heads um, have are responsible for much of the non-tax revenue. And so we have with us tonight, and we wanted, we wanted to um, get some comments on their thoughts in regards to the revenue projections based on <coughs> this economic situation that we are in. And we want to see what the difference is from the budget to the, that the Board of Selectmen voted on what we had discussed with them in past meetings and what they feel will be the 21 fiscal year 21 change due to the COVID-19 and the economic, really economic chaos that it has caused. So we have with us Betsy Brown, Tom Conley, Officer Smith, I see Chief Liddy, and we have Mr. Anthony Calabrese. So Tom Bremer, um, what we'd like to do is turn it over to Betsy Brown. I don't know if you have any comments before she comes on. And the revenues for the town clerk office is on page three of this document that we received. So this is Tom Bremer. I prefer you just to go through with the different department heads and then I can talk after them. Okay, and when we're done, we'll take a look at some of these other revenue streams, okay, to see if there's any changes that you'd like to point out to us for the same Sounds reason. Good. All right, so, Betsy, you with us? Ms. Yes, Brown? Good evening. Good evening. So if you could just, we're on page three. We're looking at the, um, the revenue adjusted due to COVID-19, and if you could just walk us through your line items, please. All of them, or do you just want the big ticket ones? Just a big ticket one. Okay. Um, recording fees. Um, I you know that we had looked at increasing for the upcoming fiscal year, but what I'm really trying to do is just keep everything flat, same as this year. So at the Board of Selectmen, my conveyance tax had been increased to $1.9 million, and I'm bringing it back down to $1.84. Okay. The unknown are reporting fees because we never know, and I'm sure the attorneys can vouch for this, if it's going to be a MERS recording or a regular recording where the state gets a bigger chunk of the money than the town does. And our copy revenue is actually increasing because more people are doing things online. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Any any questions on revenue and the adjustments that were made? Ms. Charlton? Yes, hi, Betsy. Um, can you just talk a little bit about the conveyance taxes? Um, I understand you're, you're leaving it flat, but given everything that's going on, I mean, I, I know that uh, we're, in, we're in a moment right now, and I've read a lot of reports that mortgage, mortgage applications are down by something like 35%, et cetera, and I, and I realize part of that is because everything is uh, closed down in this world of, of social distancing, but but given what's happening with the economy and particularly the unemployment, which is uh, inching up to 20%, um, how did that factor into your thoughts about the housing market and home closings and, and how that affects conveyance taxes? I mean, this, this would suggest that we will we'll be immune to any impact if, we, if we're sort of keeping it flat from prior years, that Fairfield will not see any impact. I think we'll be impacted initially because, as you said, things are closed down right now. However, we're recording basically business as usual. Uh, when we first opened, right after we, we were first closed a couple of days, we took in 15 closings that day, and four of them were over a million dollars each. Uh, as of close of business yesterday, we've brought in $1,489,000 in conveyance tax for this fiscal year. We expect to see more closings that will be recorded this week because it's the end of the month. And different uh, real estate attorneys and people in the real estate profession I've spoken with that have been through recessions before, they feel that, yeah, we'll start out slow, but that we will rebound. Our inventory will be increasing. and. Quite honestly, I think people that are in the city right now will probably want to come out to the suburbs, you know, where there's wide open spaces. I think we'll probably see a bump there, too. Yeah, I, I think you're probably right about that, and, and I've read about that as well, although I'm not sure if that will affect rentals or, or home ownership more. But I, I guess part of what I, I think about with this is understand, I understand that we've you know, the recent activity has been high, but, um, you know, this pandemic is really only six weeks old, shockingly. <laughs> it seems like it's been a lot longer, but the closings that we had recently were probably for transactions that were um, in process. And so now we're looking forward a full year. And I think we got some information from Mr. Bremer at some point that suggested conveyance taxes were down something like 35 or 38% in, in 2008 or nine. And so I just, that's where, um, even though none of us have a crystal ball, I, you know, looking out into the future, I, again, I, 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 I'm wondering if we're being optimistic, assuming that there will be no impact at all on the town from you know, the surge in unemployment, um, the tightening of lending standards that we're hearing about, and the, you know, the willingness or ability of people to go out and purchase new homes in this environment where, you know, there's so much uncertainty about jobs, et cetera. So I, and again, going back to 2008, where we had that, a, a very substantial decline. I realize this is a different recession. That one was prompted by a housing bubble and this that one was the housing bubble first. Yeah, yeah. So I, I realize it's a very different situation, but we also didn't have, you know, record levels of unemployment back then. And so I, I feel like somehow you got to factor that in. Um, I haven't spoken to any real estate experts, but I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, think from a budgeting perspective and logically, you know, would we expect in a period of high unemployment, um, you know, an equal number of people to be willing to purchase new homes? Um, so that's just wanted to get some get some more perspective on that and and uh, you know also hear your thoughts about you know what happened in the last recession. We have also recorded a couple of contracts of sale that will be coming forward in the fall, so that will help. 
and those are in the beach area and a couple up in Greenfield Hill. You know, Lori, I just jump in to say um, during my MetroCog uh, teleconference meeting yesterday uh, with the other Fairfield County leaders, um, they were all reporting a, a huge spike of New Yorkers coming to Connecticut looking for real estate. And frankly, I've been talking to a few real estate agents who are saying they're, they are like booming right now with uh, inquiries from New Yorkers who, who want to get out of New York. You know, you know, it's funny, um, a couple of realtors I talked to said that they've gotten so many inquiries from New Yorkers saying they just don't want to live there anymore. They don't think New York's going to ever be New York again. And so they don't want to pay the high prices of New York and they want to move to the, well, they're looking at Connecticut. Uh, Westport had a huge uh, influx, New Canaan, and Fairfield's become kind of a hot spot. So who knows? Um, who knows? We might actually see an, an increase in conveyance. Of, of New Yorkers wanting to get away from New York. Yeah, I've, I've read there was an article in the journal um, within the past day or two about that same phenomenon, but it, it did acknowledge that within there the market is still down. I mean, there is some shift. People are, are making inquiries, but um, I don't think we've seen any. Um, I mean, that's that's just a prediction, right? So. Um, yeah, I hear you. I, I get the perspective. I just it's. It's uh, just hard to believe in this environment where we have record unemployment that we would not have any impact. Um, and, you know, and obviously this is, you know, it, it, we typically try to budget a little bit conservatively on the revenue side. And I, um, you know, this just seems um, optimistic to me. So I, I guess I'll leave it at that. I see other people have comments. Well, Laurie, this is Tom Bremer. At the risk of, uh, you know, I feel a little bit like Don Quixote uh, against the windmills, but being flat is it actually down because conveyances have been growing. So when we say flat, that to me is a cut. That is a cut because we were expecting it to be up next year. And, and so just being flat, although it may be optimistic to you, I think is actually uh, pretty conservative. But, but, Tom, I think whatever we thought a couple months ago is, is probably irrelevant now. I mean, no one anticipated this. And so being flat means that, you know, we're, we haven't been impacted or we will not be impacted. And, and we're going to count on that and, and effectively plan to spend that money. So that's kind of where I'm, um, I'm struggling a little bit. But, again, I'll, I'll kind of yield to anyone else who wants to weigh in on this. Thank you, Ms. Charleston. It's uh, Mr. Matola and then Mr. DeWay. Thank you. Hey, Betsy, what, so things heat up in the real estate market usually in the spring, right? Yes, yeah, spring and summer markets are the hot ones. Okay. And so like a year from now or the next fiscal year, you around this time and maybe a month prior, you, you expect to see um, – more action, uh, March, April, May, and June, right? Correct. The, the hot months? Okay. All right. Um, and you're seeing a lot of action right now, right? Yep. Okay. But then I would expect that there's going to be a lull given what we're going through. But but just based on your experience and, and talking to people, you're thinking that there's going to be some type of a – and we don't know. No one really knows. So – there may be some type of a rebound, you know, around this same time period next year. Sorry, John, you kind of there's feedback. I didn't yeah, hear you there. You're, you, you, you think based on talking to attorneys and real estate people that there, there may be some type of a rebound next year right around this time period. Is Correct. that kind of what? You've been told? There's, okay. there's still right. an interest, and right now, because of the situation, inventory is down, but they really do expect there to be a rebound. Yeah. And All I've right. talked to people that have been you know, around for a while. Okay. Uh, I don't think anyone you. really knows to be honest with you. Thank you. Now, but, if I had a crystal okay. ball, I wouldn't be town clerk. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Matola. Mr. DeWitt. I think I'm okay. I, I uh, Mr. Bremer 
stole my thunder. I, I think holding it flat is actually decreasing. But um, uh, and I also think this revaluation actually will give us a little boost. But um, you know, I don't think we know. I'm 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 not inclined to reduce it more than last year, even though I know that might be overly optimistic to, to some of our board members. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Mr. Walsh. Uh, Betsy, Jim Walsh, how are you? Good, Jim, how are you? Good. Um, just a question, your conversations that you've been having with these experienced real estate veterans, um, have you been hearing them saying that they have a lot of people from New York City trying to get out? Because I've been talking to some of them, and they've told me the same thing that Brenda was reporting, which was that they all had a lot of New York City um, clients who wanted to get out of the city. They do. Customers. So, they do. Okay. Um, did they give you any sense of whether they were looking for like higher end properties, like beach properties, Greenfield Hill, you know, other expensive think, areas in town? I think they're trending more towards Greenfield Hill right now because of the space issue. They want backyards. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, and one other question. I see that you, you know, it's not a great drop, but you had your wedding marriage licenses down based on venues closed and weddings postponed, but as events start to open, are people just postponing weddings? You know, are they just a lot of them have postponed until this time next year, because right now we would be doing, you know, your May and June, July, you know, all your summer weddings, okay. and basically people have put them on hold. So you may be getting, you might be busier next spring with the people that wanted to get married this spring or putting it off for a year. Plus the people that plan on getting married next year. Okay. Right. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Uh, Ms. Charlton. Yeah, I'll just follow up on one item. So I, I, I appreciate the discussion, and I, I do know and I have read that, that you know, there's interest um, in the market for New Yorkers. I, I think part of what no one knows at this point is, really how that's going to play out because if you live in New York and you work in New York and now you're thinking about moving to Connecticut and commuting to New York using public transportation in particular, this is, um, you know, it, it's not a small thing. So I think part of it will depend on, you know, do we have permanent alterations in the workforce and do we have more permanent uh, work from home arrangements? And, and there's just a lot of different things I think that come into play there. So, um, you know, I may have more of a pessimistic view on this. I think we just have to understand that to the extent we're wrong or we're too optimistic here, this is just um, a shortfall that will, you know, that will ultimately pick up in fund balance. And so we, you know, we can accept that, um, you know, or, or we can, you know, be more conservative. But um, again, I hear what everyone's saying. I'm not sure I agree, but uh, appreciate the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Charlton. Hey, Bessie, it's, it's Jim Brown. Just a question for you. You mentioned uh, 2007, 2008, and the conveyance tax dropping by about 30 some odd percent. What do you, and you, you answered this, but I missed it. What do you see the difference? And why are you more confident now as you I don't I don't think you knew what was gonna happen in two thousand seven, obviously, but you're fairly confident today. What do you see the difference in what you're seeing today is what happened to us in two thousand seven, two thousand eight? That was actually when the housing bubble burst, that recession as opposed to you know, this is a pandemic. And the people that you're talking to, speaking with, don't see us having any type of any type of bubble, any type of issue uh, going into 2021. They feel that gonna, you know, because of our location and what our inventory is, what we have to offer with the various types of property, that we should be in good shape. And as a matter of fact, as Mr. DeWitt said, I completely forgot that you know the reval will be coming up. So that'll have an effect, you know, with property values as well. Uh, Mr. Testani? Yes. Uh, hey, Betsy, how are you? Good, Jack. 
Hey, just want to review. You mentioned that there have been some recent house closings already, correct? And I'm going to guess even from my own personal experience within the last couple of weeks, a fairly decent amount of house um, refis on the increase. So we've had various kinds of interactions or, or charges right through the town clerk's office. So yeah. your your calculations are based on what you're seeing as trends as well, not just what you're speculating. Is that fair to say? That's correct. Uh, through close of business yesterday, we've had 70 property transfers for the month of April. For the month of April. And how does that compare to last year? Hold on one second. I'll flip there. Sounds like a decent number considering we're in the middle of a pandemic as we've been discussing. Last year we had 59. We're ahead. It's great. So I would think if the trend is to the positive in that direction, that it would be a good indication that we're going to stay uh, in, a, in a positive trend and we can rely on at least to a certain extent some of the numbers that we've been talking about and this week we had a couple of commercial sales and don't forget the joe's american bar and grill property is for sale right now so there are commercial properties out there as well that'll hopefully come to fruition in the next fiscal year okay thank you okay any more questions for ms brown uh, mr walsh Maybe April was kind of higher because March low because shutdown orders had started happening in March. Can you give us a comparison about what last year's were in March and what this year's were? Last year, March was 60. This year, March was, is 60. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Walsh. Any further questions? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay, next is Mr. Tom Conley, our chief building official. Mr. Conley, how are you tonight? I am well. How are you? Can you hear me? Can hear you very well. Hello. Thank you. Oh, good. Good. Good evening, everyone. Yep. Thanks for having me tonight. I hope I don't take up too much of your time. I know um, I'm getting up early. I have to drive to Georgia to get a haircut tomorrow. So, <laughs> bring back, bring back a so, barber for so, Yeah. So, listen. Before I start, I just want to give a little shout out to my guys here, my coworkers. I know everybody. Um, we talk about essential frontline workers. My guys are out in the field every single day, um, battling this. Um, they're they're um, using PPEs, gloves, masks, the whole thing. So I just want everybody to know that we're out there every single day. Uh, we're taking in uh, uh, permit money, um, revenue money every single day, and my guys are fighting the battle. So I had to give that shout out in front of everybody so that you guys know that we are um, essential frontline workers out there. So I just want to you know, kind of kind of throw that out yeah. there. I don't want to take up a lot of your time with it, but no, could acknowledge that. So um, right. I, I, I'm not sure where you want to start with this, so I have a couple of facts and figures I want to throw at you, if I can, just some uh, uh, some uh, permit activity reports, if I can just give you year-to-date, uh, two months and one month, just to show you where we're at, if, if that would kind of start this out right. That will help. Thank you very much. We can begin there. Yeah, so year to date, I'm um, just a little over three million dollars in revenue. So that's, um, you know, actually really where I should be right now. Um, two months since the um, uh, COVID nineteen began, I'm uh, to date three hundred nineteen thousand um, dollars, even during the um, the pandemic. And April alone. I'm at $180,000 of revenue. So 
Um, I have on my desk probably 30 to 40 permits. Uh, some of them are large. I have Fairfield Prep that is um, probably fifty, sixty thousand dollar permit fee, revenue fee to the town. Um, unfortunately, I'm so busy I can't get to a code review. I have a child care facility that's coming uh, to Fairfield. Again, I'm so busy I can't get to to um, do a code review on these. So um, it's just a little, you know, kind of a time capsule of where we are. Uh, I know we talked last time that everybody thought that we'd be down and I know some of this money is in the pipeline, uh, but Fairfield Prep is, uh, they're stripping out an entire building. They're, they're, um, the whole educational facility is stripping down, and they're going to rebuild uh, for the summer. Uh, we're, we're hoping if I can get a code review out there. I gave them a demolition permit, so hopefully we can get a code review online and they can you know, get back into shape there. So I, I just wanted to kind of bring that revenue up to um, – the forefront here, because I know that everybody wants me to reduce my revenue. I have conversations with Griffith University and Sacred Heart University, and uh, their money is in the pipeline, and I think that we're still good for the money. Um, and the projects, um, Sacred Heart's only drawback on their major project up there is other uh, departments. They need approvals from conservation and zoning and they're ready to go on on some big projects up there so um i just kind of a little we're on that so so Tom, this is jim yeah this is jim brown the question is on building permits um due to covid19 showing a negative not a negative but a reduction of two hundred seventy three thousand seven twenty four. is that your number so um, I, I think that that came as um, we were going to go um, uh, scale back to a three-year average because everybody thinks that I, I believe that's what we're talking, right? We're at the um, two two million nine four three, correct? Which would have been a a three-year average, right. which we that's, have agreed on. That's that's correct, Tom. Yeah, so that's where I thought we, you know, just to give everybody some satisfaction, be a little more conservative here, uh, bring it back from my original estimates of uh, 3.2 million, uh, bring it back to a three-year average of that um, 2.943 million. So just to kind of give everybody a little feel good about the whole thing and a little more conservative, I have no problem with that. Um, I actually believe we're going to do more than that, but... Um, since the, the the push was to kind of get it more conservative, um, I'm on I'm on board with that. I, I truly believe, given what I have on my table and given what we've done in the two month period and just um, this past month alone, um, I believe we're going to meet our projections without a problem. So, Tom, again, it's Jim Brown. So, like our town clerk, your feeling is that this pandemic and um, you know, the economic environment that it has caused will not affect your revenue outside the three-year average. Yeah, I think the three-year average is good. I think what I'm seeing, um, and I've used this phrase with other people, I'm seeing a real Main Street dead spot, but side streets are crazy. Everybody's doing things um, all over, things that I didn't think would happen. Uh, like I said, a child care, they're, they're pushing to get our marshal and I to do a code review. I, I don't have the time. I'm I'm, I'm inundated uh, with work. I mean, permits are coming in every single day, um, to, you know, and not just you know one or two. I'm probably processing ten, fifteen, twenty a day, and that's a that's a lot of it's a lot of footwork right now. But um, so uh, you know, and and this is a time when I thought people would scale back. Nobody wants you in your house. Nobody wants to do anything. Um, it, um, I actually thought it might be a little bit less, but I, I'm I'm forging ahead. Hey, thank you. You know, that's going to take me later on to the fire marshal fees. Then why they would be going down based on what you're saying by a hundred thousand dollars? But that's that's a question to someone else at another time. So I'll turn it over to the board, uh, Mr. Dewitt. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris DeWitt. Uh, good evening, Mr. Conley. Good evening, Chris. I want to go on record as saying I want, I want your revenue to go up. And you said before everyone's looking for your revenue to come down, not me. Um, listen, you're the expert. If you're telling us that at this critical juncture – You've got long-term plans, long-term activities coming in. I, I, I don't feel any, I don't feel any reason to to take your number down. I mean, the three-year average is if that's conservative, okay. But um, you know, I don't want to over, I don't want to be over conservative either. So again, I, I know your opening statement was you, people are looking for you to cut it. I want to go on record as saying I, I, I want to hear what you have to say and. and and, and base our decision off of, of your information, not what others are telling you. So thank you for being yeah, here. Thank today. you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. I, I still think, you know, the three-year average is perfect for me. Um, I, I think it works. It works for everybody. It makes everybody on your side feel good about it. I appreciate your um, support there. I think the three-year average is good. Um, and I and obviously if I do better, we've always done better anyway. Um whenever we've come in with revenue projections, we've, we've always done better. So, um, you know, in, in a conservative sense, I think the three-year average works for everybody. So I, I'd be real happy with that. All right. Then, I, then I'm on board. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. DeWitt. Uh, Ms. Marmion. Thank you. Um and I appreciate your perspective in terms of what's coming in the door right now. That's that's really good news. I have heard that a lot of people are home right now, uh, working from home, and they're doing home projects, you know, remodeling a kitchen, et cetera, things like that. Um, so that's that's very good news. I guess I, I'm, you know, nervous Nelly here in that um, I'm looking not just for right now but forward. People are concerned that the virus might um, – rear its head again in the fall, and then we might go through a tough time in the winter. So, you know, I am a little bit more cautious in terms of looking forward, in terms of what people will um, move forward on. In terms of Sacred Heart, that's great news. They, they had said that they would go forward with existing projects, but no new uh, capital um, uh, investments. So we'll see, but um, appreciate what you have to say in terms of looking at the three-year average, um, and hopefully that's, um, that's right where we're going to end up. So thank you. Sure. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Ms. Marmion. Um, Mr. Walsh. Hey, Tom, how are you? I'm well, Jim. How are you? Doing great. Um, so where do you stand right now with the amount of uh, building permit revenue that you brought in so far to date? So I'm a little over $3 million. A little bit above $3 million. And for the budget for last year, that's all permits, Tom? Yeah, correct. That's um, a mechanicals, electrical, plumbing, and the building permits. So that's, that's a total. Okay, so you're a little over $3 million, and we, you, the fiscal year budget was two point. Seven million dollars, and you're Correct. still going to be bringing in more. You think you'll get that prep check for the fifty or whatever <laughs> thousand dollars? <laughs> Absolutely, I'm I'm pushing for it. I'm. Uh, no, I, I guess before I have, the end of this year. Absolutely, Jim. No okay. question about it. No question. I'm going to get okay. that money so, in. I'm going to one way or another. You, I'm going to get that money. Yeah, in. yeah, yeah. But I mean, it sounds like you're going to be like soaring past. The budget last well um I, i'm already past it so i know, uh, I know. yes so but now you put me like... in a spot with caitlin she's going to be asking me how much more so yeah 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 i'm gonna um i'm gonna soar past yes i'm already past and i'm gonna take more in absolutely um no question okay I, I don't have any more um, I guess to ask for. It's just to see why we would whatever. Uh, we'll, we'll deal with it when we have to talk about it. But I really appreciate your uh, you asking everybody. 
to give us sure. the confidence sure. to do what we got to do. Um, yeah. Because, you know, I think we were all fearful of it. And, uh, but there's also just a ton of stuff going on. You just drive around and you see it. And it's great to see that Fairfield University and Sacred Heart are still con- continuing with their projects. Because as we discussed the last time, those are budgeted capital projects. And, and most of their projects are not budgeted capital projects. They're money that's raised privately through alumni, um, which is still money that's going to be spent. They're not going to just keep the money and not do the project because the alumni have been sure. promised that that money is going to be used for those specific projects. All right. Thank you very sure. much. And, and and I want to add, too, just for the uh, board, um, I spoke to Fairfield U, their people today, at great length, by the way, um, you know, without really hammering down numbers with them, uh, but I did ask sensitive questions. Do you have the money to do it? Are you, you know, are you scaling back? What are you doing? They have three fairly good, one major, major project that um, they're, they're gonna, is going to come in for next year and two other fairly good-sized projects. They, they um, have, uh, I, I guess we would call it endowment money. They're not worried about money up there. So... Um, you know, just a level of confidence as long as, you know, nothing else major changes. Um, both the universities are going to spend money. So, um, I, you know, and that's, that's today's speak. That, that happened just today. So um, with a conference from both universities. So and I don't know if that helped, helped really help. everybody. Yeah. It, listen, it, it helped me. It, I, I'll have a job next year. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. We have a couple more. I want to ask some questions, Tom, and, and uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Bateson. Uh, mine Thank was you. asked Thank and you. answered. Thanks, Jim. Hi, Ed. How are yeah. you? Good to hear your voice. Hey, you too, Tom. Take care, bud. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Mr. Testani. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just curious, uh, how does that compare, Tom, to, I know we talked a little bit about it, I just want to get a sense of where you think we are now versus last year and what you're projecting into the future looks pretty uh, promising, like sort of reflected of what we talked about with the town clerk. Would that be fair to say? Um. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm not sure specifics to that, but uh, last year we did three, by uh, three point six million. I'm at three million now. We're going to approach that, and it, um, you know, there's a lot of projects out there that that you know they're simply waiting approval. So yeah, I mean, we're going to, you know, I'm ho- I'm hoping to say we're going to take in another two hundred thousand. So maybe this year we'll be at yeah, without nailing it down, you know, another 200000 on it. So, you know, $3.2 million for this, for this year for, and, and possibly more. I'm, 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 I'm uh, uh, hopeful of that. Sacred Heart did say that they have two smaller jobs that, so their jobs have to be done before kids enter their building. So they are looking at summertime jobs. Um, and and they did not give me dollar figures on it, but they have two, you know, smaller jobs coming out, and so I expect money from Sacred Heart again. So that's for this fiscal year. So maybe another quarter of a million dollars. That's great. That's great news, and I'm, I'm happy to hear everybody as well. That's been out the proper PPE and stuff. They've all been. Um, feeling well, everybody's been staying healthy, sounds like, which is great. And they all deserve the credit you gave them. So thank you for acknowledging them and for all the work you guys are doing. Sure. Thank you. All right. Uh, any further questions? Seeing none. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Have a good evening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Good night, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Good night. Okay. We're going to go to Chief Liddy and Chief Smith. And uh, last meeting, there was questions on the ECC and the impact of a delayed opening. They were asked to put together some scenarios and an an analysis, which they have done. So I want to thank you. 
uh, Chief Smith and Chief Woody for doing that. And the board should have this document, right? It says ECC, Delayed Opening Budget Impact Analysis. So assuming the board has this in front of them, I'm looking to make sure before we start. Uh, it was uh, in the same packet that Jennifer had sent over as backup. Yep, I have it. Okay. Everybody have it? Okay, very good. Uh, so, Chief Smith, I'm going to turn it over to you. If you could walk us through this analysis, please. Is what our monthly operating expense is based on our current budget, and if that were to continue into the next fiscal year, and then the monthly impact on the new proposed budget, depending on the start date, and then play that out. So, for the example, August, if you look at expenses, that's one month of current expenses and 11 months of the projected expenses. And it moves forward from there. And I do the same thing with revenue. Uh, I'm just trying to keep it simple, difference, you know, uh, depending on the month we start. Okay, so up in the top left, you have current fiscal year 2020, that's the budget, monthly budget, state subsidy, proposed annual of two million, on sixty nine a month. Okay. Correct. Okay. Any questions from the board? If I may, this is Tom Bremer. I'm just looking at the document. And I think it's a little, at least if it was for me, a little confusing. Yeah. yeah. Um, the way the way I look at this document, and I think, and Linda's sitting here, she's the one who put it together, and this is how she looks at this. If you look at August, the total revenue is 1076. You have to deduct the... Uh, no, 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 right. no, no. Right. It's That's a net. Right. It's the net of the expense and the revenue. All right, so the net of the expense and the revenue. Here's the revenue on 107.6. The budget cost is 922. Yes, it's it's 47,000 more than the total budget cost. Oh, I see. Okay, so so from July to August, the total is 47,404. That's the cost of not opening until August. Then the following month, September. The cost of not opening is an additional 90, uh, no, is, no, is it's included, it's 94449 Likewise, in October, the cost now jumps to 141493 So assuming they don't open, let's say, till uh, November 1st, we're looking at an additional cost of $141,493. Okay, so what you did was you went down the revenue line, 1162253 for July, and then August, September, October, right? Hey, Jim. Uh, first of all, uh, Deputy Chief uh, Don Smith prepared the document. What I did is I just looked at the month over month net change to get what the additional or the incremental cost would be. So the expense and the revenue in July nets to 875,008. That's how much the cost would be for the year if we operated in the old way, rather than going to the, no, that's the cost if we operated in the new way. There would be a, a, a net, cost to us of 875,008 or our portion of the ECC cost. If we delayed the opening till August, we would increase our cost to 922,412. The difference being it would cost us an, an additional 47 grand. 
Likewise, if we delay till September 1st, and I think that's what the deputy chief is thinking, it would cost us marginally under 95,000 because you're blending two rates. You're taking two months of the non-joint ECC plus 10 months of the joint ECC. All right, that helps. Thank you, Linda. You're taking the total budget costs and just going down the line. All right, Mr. DeWitt. So, what, in, uh, Linda, when you're saying total revenue, um, you're, you're, that number is going down because... This is a good so, question for so Deputy Smith, though. I'd like him to answer. Well, no, because you're, yes, you're, the, one who's, who, you're the one who's telling us that... Right. You're the one who's what, what saying happened? that the total... The yeah, they're both talking down. at the same time. All right, so hold on one second. So first of all, all right, Linda, do you want to defer the question to Chief Smith? Yes. So, so if I understood the question is the revenue being decreased and it is decreased because the anticipated and the big chunk of that is the Westport cost share. So one month they wouldn't be paying, which is about a $69,000 off their annual bill per se per month that we don't open. And then there's also New Canaan revenue of 70,000, that's a $5,000 a month hit that we would anticipate bringing in if we opened in July 1st that we're not gonna see until the opening date. So that's where the, the loss of revenue comes in. Got it. So your your expenses for, for all intent and purpose kind of are, are, are kind of flat, even though I know they would be a little bit less if you're not in the building but the real change here is that you're, we, we have reduced revenue because we're not getting any revenue resources and the budget goes up because we're operating the old way for longer. Correct, yeah, we're remaining at the same cost but we're not getting the additional revenue that's anticipated with the opening of the new center. Right, so the answer is like like 40, I think 47,000, so every month, so you're not open to cost us $47,000, it looks like. Yeah. Um, actually, I think a little bit more. You're probably looking at about 70 something thousand dollars uh, that no, we no, don't open. No. No? no. Okay. No, it, it's, 47, the, it's 47,000 a month. You're right, Chris. It's about 47 grand a month. Yeah, okay. Okay, great. Then now, now what about our customers here? Our, our <laughs> You know, our, our three revenue generating customers here, I mean, clearly they understand that this is going on, but there, nothing changes if this goes out two, three, four, or five months, right? They're still all on board. No. Correct. They're all aware. We have a working group that is comprised of representatives from Westport that are working to put this together. So they are aware of every step of this. Got it. All right. Thanks, Chief. Go ahead. All right, thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Uh, Mr. Walsh, you had a question? Sure. Um, hello, uh, Deputy Chief. Um, thanks for being here. Um, I kind of get the revenue numbers out. Explain to me why the, why the expense goes down over time. Is that because the monthly uh, costs to run the center? Because the cost to run our existing center is less than the cost to run the new center. The longer we hold off opening the doors, we stay at the existing um, monthly rate of 131,384 versus okay. the new rate. So our costs do go down over that period that we're not opening because we're just not up to the new uh, levels yet. That's about $28,000 difference. Uh, correct. Got it. What is the, uh, did I hear Linda say earlier that you think that we're not going to open until February? Or did, did I not understand? I am that? looking at, so I, we, after the meeting last week, I sort of did some more talking with architect and the team. 
Um, we're looking at a September opening date at this point. That would be two months late at approximately $47,000 a month. Yeah, it's two months late. I, I don't have the number in front of me of what you're referring to, but okay. yes. All right. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Any further questions? Mr. Tistani? Hey, Chief. Just a quick question. We don't incur any penalties by being late, do we at all? No, none at all. It's just okay. we don't get the anticipated revenue until we open the doors. That's all. Yeah, but there's no, we don't, like Westport, New Canaan, we don't incur any penalties from those towns and we don't have any other, any, any repercussions, financial repercussions for opening late. No, we do not. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any further, Mr. Walsh? Yeah, Deputy Chief. Um, in regards to the revenues, is our agreement set up so that it, it equally goes down like this over time? So the revenue is just set up with the 67-33 quad split. So once we were up and running, that stays then the same. It doesn't alter. It's going to be the 67-33 moving forward. The reason we're just seeing the revenues go down and the, the projection you got is because we're just not going to be getting them. Um, and so the, it, in the chart you have, it's just because we're not opening as early, so we're not collecting the revenues. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Ms. Walsh. Any qu further questions on this document? Yeah, Jim, it's Ed Bateson. Go ahead, Ed. Yeah, quick thing. I, I just want to, uh, Don, I just want to make sure I understand it. it. If we're thinking we're going to be not opening until September, it, it sounds like we're going to have to plan for to adjust your this ECC budget for two months. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. Yes, I'm looking September as the open date. Okay, so if I do that, it sounds like, I'm going to fly. I'm going to do this on the fly. It sounds like I'm going to have to reduce revenue by twenty thousand dollars, and it says monthly. I'm sorry. No, it's net net. It's cost. It's going to be somewhere around forty-five thousand dollars a month, right? So it looks like I'm going to take a hit for ninety thousand dollars if I don't open this thing until September. Net revenue and expense. Yeah, I would have to do the math, but that sounds about right. Okay. All right, and right now our best guesstimate is September. September. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Any further questions on this document? If not, any questions on the document that was sent over? Uh, by the chief in regards to the department vehicle list. Except the fact, how many, how many vehicles does this add up to? I did a quick, this is Tom Bremer. I did a quick count. It's, it looks like 109 vehicles plus motorcycles and bicycles. And if I can add that, that's an entire inventory. It includes speed reader trailers, basically anything with wheels. And it also includes decommissioned vehicles that are waiting for auction that are not in use in any way, shape, or form. Okay, I'm sorry, Chief. How many are not in use? I, on that list, there is definitely five that are just being scuttled for parts at this point. That's so about 105 vehicles that are already in use. Is that fair? 
if I if I heard your question correctly, about 105 units, including trailers and things like that. Yes. Any further questions on this list? Yeah, Jim, it's Ed uh, Mason. Go ahead, Ed. Yeah, uh, thanks for putting that together this sheet, guys. I'm not going to lie. I, I was I was surprised at how many vehicles you guys have. Uh, I, I haven't had a chance to sit down and look at it, but, you know, it, Tom Bremer, I know you're contemplating a, a, a fleet. I just, wow. <laughs> I, that, that was, that was my response as I well. Expect, I, 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 you know, I'm in favor of police services, but I was just like, I really, I'm not going to lie, guys. I thought 40 vehicles. Now I know why I can't get past Nichols Street. I, I'm like, I really think we need to sit down and take a look at this and figure out. You know, if, if I could possibly things. present you with a new document, you know, we just gave you an, an inventory of everything that we had. It, it includes a lot of trailers and things of that nature specialty vehicles, a command post, a prisoner transport van. Um, we have since produced a document that consists solely of police cars that you look at as true, and we look at as traditional police cars. And I'd be happy to send that along for comparison. Yeah, please do, if that'll make me sleep better at night. Thank you. Okay. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, Mr. Walsh. I counted 112 vehicles, and I understand that there are trailers and stuff that should be deducted out of there, but I, I will tell you, this was a shocking, shocking document. It almost showed that you had more vehicles than police officers. Um, and I, I think we're going to have to take a look at this. And Mr. Bremer, I know, wants to talk about cars at town hall, and, and I almost think that we should have a board of finance committee to kind of meet with figure this whole inventory out just like there seems to be a lot of cars sitting around you know a lot of things out here I mean, 112 vehicles I mean, it's just, even if they're trailers i mean just a lot of stuff um so i don't think we're you know i don't think there's anything to do for the budget but um i think we're going to need to get involved with this after july or something like that dig into this and Maybe everything's perfect and fine. Or maybe, maybe all the town vehicles are, are all great or not great. I, I don't know, but we have a lot of questions on both sides of this, and I think we're going to have to really look at it because just a lot of stuff. So point of order, Mr. Chairman, we, we had started this process on the town side um, before the pandemic hit when we were building our budget. And we fully intend as an administration to be looking at all of these things in the coming year. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kupchak. Well, between this, 112 here and uh, DPW, yeah, I think that's a lot to put together. All right, any further questions on this list? Okay. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to Mr. Calabrese, you still with us? There you are. Okay, so we're going to look at, at your revenue. It's like things are opening up uh, May 1, or at least somewhat May 1. Maybe you could talk to us a little bit about that. And the revenue is on page 2 of the document that we received, starting with recreation and going right down the page. So where would you like to start, Anthony? Um, I can just let you know that, obviously, uh, Par 3 Golf Course is scheduled to open this Friday. The driving range is scheduled to open. And then Smith, uh, probably in the next within the next two weeks, will open as well. Um, and then our beaches um, are open currently for residents only. Um, all revenue projections on the sheet that you guys have are uh, assuming that everything is open as of July 1, which is what it looks like it will be. So. Happy to talk as of July 1, you mean completely Correct. open? That is the assumption. Mr. DeWitt? I see a lot. 
Yeah, you're going to get a lot of questions. Here we go. Yeah, this this one might be for um, um, Ms. Kupchak, uh, as Chris DeWitt. So I I watched your, your press conference and I and I read the um, the press release to what's opening and it's it's nice to hear Mr. Calibri saying the <coughs> excuse me Carl Dickman will be open in in the beaches. But um, my question is, so at the beaches, uh, Penfield, for example, no parking, I get it, but people can't congregate or bring, you know, coolers. Um, And, you know, because my my question is... Chris, I couldn't hear that last part. You faded out a little bit. Oh, I, I apologize. Who is policing... The, um, the enforcement of not congregating on beaches, because if it's the police, I'm really careful that our, uh, we're going to be taking some big overtime hits to numbers and, and, and like that. No, actually, we're going to have, um, and Chris, uh, I don't know if Chris Liddy might see these off, but um, we're going to have one officer patrolling the beach, and we'll be having one officer uh, at Lake Mohegan. Okay. Okay, and, and, and we think well, again, it's not our job to keep, you know, people from doing stupid things, but okay. So it's not an well, over we just want to make right. sure we do want they are our town owned spaces and we want to make sure that they're not jeopardizing anyone's health and safety. Uh so we do want to have law enforcement there, only because some people, um have a little bit of a difficult understanding of how to follow rules or get upset when they can't do what they want to do. So in, a, in an effort to protect other members of our public, we want to make sure that those who are following the rules are not being jeopardized by those who are not. And I think that's our responsibility as a town to provide that to our residents. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thank you for that. Okay, thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Uh, Ms. Charlton. Hi, Anthony. Um, when you say everything, this is since everything is open July 1st, does that mean fully open, like no social distancing, no limits on gatherings, or what, what exactly do you mean by that? That's the assumption that we're making here, yes. So I know we don't have the details, but... Um, I've been listening to the governor's press conference and his what they are are calling it is task force on on reopening, but that that's not consistent with what with what they're saying. They're talking about opening in stages with continuing limits on large gatherings at until the end of the calendar year at least, based on how the data works. So how does that jive with us? Uh opening everything fully. Yep, so what I did here, uh, as you'll see on the Penfield line, I assume we would lose half of our rentals in July and August. And then by September, we would be pretty much back to normal. So that's the dip in uh, revenue there is. Everything else assumes pretty much a 50% loss of participation for programs. Um, trying to take into consideration exactly what you're talking about. I've looked at the federal government guidelines. I've, I've I listen to the press conferences every day uh, with Governor Lamont. Um, I see that he's talking right now with the reopening things within seven to ten days um, and then going through phase one, two, and three in most of these cases. If we do that, we end up hitting, you know, a mid-June timeline, which puts us right on for that July. Um, I do understand, um, you know, we don't really know what the social distancing guidelines are going to be uh, for gatherings. I mean, if we can look at those phases and we can we can see by the time we get to phase three we are back to large group gatherings but again it all depends on what the the data shows as we go through each of those phases so i've i've got to make an assumption at some point that we're going to be open so that's what we did here and those are the assumptions that i, I used when we were putting this together okay yeah it, maybe it doesn't matter i i did not understand based on their comments that we were going to be back to large group gatherings in june um at all um i i think there's that's really questionable but i you know even with that i i understand that you've 
reduced revenues, you know, regardless, um, based on reduced participation. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure what else we can do. I guess that's the only piece I would probably get more clarity on. I, I just, I don't think that's right. Um, I, even with the phases, and that, of course, assumes there's no uptick in infections mm -hmm. as we start opening up and if they are they're going to you know pull back but um i i can't remember if it was in um an interview or in a, a recent presser that he had but i thought it seemed pretty clear that they were going to continue to have limits on gatherings so i don't know um if ultimately that would make a difference in these revenue projections given you've taken a haircut on some of them anyway um but, uh, you know, I guess we just have to, I guess we'll have time before we vote, but it's just something to think about. Okay, thank you, Ms. Charlton. Mr. Matola? You can hear me, right, Jim? I can't hear you, though. I don't know why. That's because I put myself on mute, but I can hear you. All right, good. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Anthony. <laughs> hey, John. Well, my wife wants to mute me a lot, so uh, that's okay. So I think you answered my, one of my questions, Anthony. The, the, the Penfield loss that you have here, my question was, does, does that represent the 50% mean a loss of all of July and August or just 50% of rentals for July and August? 50% of July and then 50% of August. Okay. Of what we have um, on the books is already. Gotcha. All right. And um, are you starting to think, and maybe you haven't, uh, about what is for your summer programs and your camps and so on and so forth, have you started thinking if, if you're able to open what um, procedures, safeguards that you might be able to implement to, to make it safer for the counselors and the, the, the kids who attend those camps? Has there been a thought process with respect to that yet? Yeah. Now, with our health department and our emergency management team, um, you know, looking at CDC guidelines and different recommendations that the federal government are putting out for camps. I mean, right now they're talking about small groups of no more than 10 um, per counselor and, you know, no, no campsite can have more than 30 kids on site. And they're talking about temperature, you know, taking temperatures and staff have to wear masks and, you know, no shared equipment and no field trips. There's, there's a lot of things they're talking about. So um, we are going to do our best to try to offer camp in the, the best fashion that we can. Um, we know it, it, it's an essential service that people rely on, so we want to offer that. And to, yeah, add, I, to, that, I think... John, add to that, John, we, we, Anthony and I started a discussion today, and we're going to be talking more about um, with our emergency management team and the health director trying to plan out how we can offer camp to um, based on these federal guidelines we received, um, how we can offer camp to our residents. Obviously, we want to give the, we want to do everything we can to offer something for parents so they could get back to work um, if they're allowed to at least. Um, so that, that's yeah. a high price for us. I, I think that's a good idea. I think the, the more you can publicize that, parents would be put at ease and uh, may want to send their kids to camp. I think I think most parents want to do that. Uh, could be wrong about that. Um, the other question I had, Brenda, more for you and Anthony, um, and it's you may not know the answer right now. It's it's more of a legal question. But are are we allowed to totally uh, close our beaches this summer to non-residents? I know you're doing it right now, but moving forward, has there been a thought about that and if yes i think from a legal standpoint i think it's something that we would need to look into and i'm just curious if there's ever you've been thinking about that moving forward well mr baldwin uh advised me that because we're under a state of the emergency i could um restrict our spaces to only our, our okay. residents you know um i'm going to continue to do that until i think um 
is safe. So uh, we'll see, John. Okay. We'll but if, we, if, if, if this emergency situation goes through the summer and you may be able to do that, that would, uh, more, this is probably more for Anthony, that would affect our revenue too, right, Anthony? That would affect our revenue, absolutely. And if you, but you, but you got that time, accounted the for the time, revenue? We might be able to um, have some kind of social distancing uh, guidelines in place over the summer to allow it um, to have out of towners. So we're still working through that and we gotta see how it goes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I don't have any more questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Matola. Ms. Marmion. Thanks. Um Anthony, just to follow up on what Mr. Matola had um have been talking about in terms of the summer camp, you um, are estimating a 50% loss of participation. Have you had um, cancellations? For I know some of the parents have already enrolled their kids. They enrolled, I don't know, back in earlier, but have you had a number of cancellations? We've had a few. I, would, I wouldn't say a number. Um, again, I, I think what camp ultimately ends up looking like if it can happen. Um, and then if people feel safe, um, which is why I've reduced that number there by 50%. Okay. Um, my second question is, is with Penfield in terms of lost revenue or lost bookings basically for July and August, is the 50% reduction, um, are you projecting forward as well into the fall and or the winter given, um, again, that people are concerned that the virus will kind of come back uh, in the fall and the winter. Does that, does this 50% encapsulate that those months as well? Or are you just looking at July and August? I just looked at July and August, assuming um, that people would be afraid and, and would uh, either move or cancel their parties at that point. Um, so no, it does not look at, you know, November, December, where we don't have many parties anyway in, in the winter months, but um you know, the next bulk of parties would be uh, April, May, where we'd have to worry again. Okay, so the lost revenue in the fall and the winter, it, you don't think it's worthwhile to project that? We don't know. Obviously, it's an unknown, but um, it's hard. It, it may not be enough money to uh, justify that calculation, correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Marmy and uh, Ms. Ms. Charlton. Thanks. Um, just a couple follow-up questions to make sure I, I have the numbers right. Um, obviously, there are a lot of unknowns in here because it d depends on the progression of, of this virus. But as it relates to summer camps, what is that the program's line item in the budget? That is. Okay, so that so we currently now have eighty thousand dollars of revenue remaining for camps. That's it. it. And that's all our programming. Okay, so only a portion of that is camps. Correct. Okay. All right. So it's it's not really that much revenue risk when you think about it. I mean, I I read the um, uh, some the guidance that the state is talking about um, regarding summer camps and, and it's in line with everything you said. I think the thing that you have to keep in mind though from a risk perspective is, you know, all this sounds good. Kids have to wash their hands. They have to socially distance. The minute you have one COVID exposure of a kid or a counselor, it's done, right? Okay. And so, you know, that is not unlikely to happen. So um, I think that's just important for us to keep in mind because if it's only a fraction of the $80,000, I think you just have to make an assumption and move on because it's not that much money. Um, I do think it, w it is worth revisiting, um, and, and maybe this is one of the last things we do, that, that the rentals at Penfield and Durrell are not small amounts. That's, I mean, we've got, am I looking at this right? So that's half a million dollars in the budget yeah. for those rentals. And the only assumption there is that Half of the parties from July and August get canceled. So that assumes we would be having large gatherings half the time in the summer months and then thereafter. So, you know, I tend to think that that one's probably um, 
you know, it is what it is at this point, but, you know, if we learn anything else, I, I think that's the one that's probably worth revisiting um, as we move forward because we're going to, um, well, let's see, by the time, I'm not sure what we're going to know by the time we vote, but, but based on what the state has said thus far and the guidance that they've given, I, I think that that is the one that's probably um, a little bit out of line from, from what I've heard at least in terms of what we're gonna be facing from a, a social distancing uh, policy and restriction level. Okay, thank you, Ms. Charlton. Any further questions from the board? Mr. Walsh. Um, how you doing, Anthony? Good, Jim, how are you? I'm pretty well. In regards to the recreation programs, are you going to be hiring less, um, are there going to be less expenses going out the door because you're going to hire less counselors, I presume, right? That depends on the layout of what camp ends up looking like. Um, the goal, I think, would be to try to service the same number of kids that we service currently, um, just spread out throughout the town more than they are, you know, they wouldn't be at five different campsites. They might be at 15 different campsites. And again, I don't know what that looks like yet, whether we're utilizing the senior center or, you know, St. Emory's or some other buildings that the town has access to um, where we can, we can keep groups of 30 kids. You know, um, if we keep our five sites and we can only have 30 kids, it's 150 kids. I mean, that's almost not worth running at that point. Um, so if we have to go down and have more sites where we have a, a ratio of um, 10 to 1, we would actually hire more counselors. But we'd be eliminating the field trips, therefore we're going to save expenses there. We'd actually probably make a little more money if we're not paying the big money on the field trips. Okay. So you're basically – so why do you think the programming on your recreation line at 80,000 is going down? It's not from the camp, but you're going to try to still have the exact same amount of – kids you're just going to spread them out regarding all these other locations so why is the number going down well my thought is to have the same number of kids but i think we're going to have i think we're going to have less just because we offer camp i think you're going to have people say well i'm not sending my kid to camp because this virus is still out there um fall soccer we don't know if fall soccer is going to happen if fall soccer doesn't happen you know that's a lot of that's a big chunk of that money right there is fall soccer um you know so we lose that money uh if winter basketball doesn't happen, again, even if those things do happen, I don't know that we're going to have the thousands of kids that we normally have playing. Okay. So that's why I, that's what I, I was looking at a 50% loss of participation in all our large programs. Okay. And give me the reasons for the assumption of the um, beach parking, the 50%. Pretty much, that assumption, again, is just pretty much to uh, what Ms. Uh, Charlton was talking about. Um, just because you have it open doesn't mean people want to go back out and get in these crowds again. And I think we may see that, you know, this weekend, unfortunately, um, when we have the good weather Sunday, you know, 70 degrees, I think you're going to have people that want to get back out there. But I think there's going to be a lot of people that are going to say, no way, I'm, I'm not going back out there yet. It, it's not safe for me. And that's, you know, people are going to make that decision. Um, the daily parking line for the, uh, the beach parking, that's our daily parking. Those are, that would be the non-residents or people that don't have a beach sticker. So, All right. And then the uh, gas dock concessions going down by 50% because we've had the marina close. I, I am making, I was making that assumption. Um, that, that may change now that he can open and he didn't really miss, he only missed two weeks of the season. So, again, not a, not a big ticket item in our budget, um, but I wanted to play it safe just because I know how our concessionaires are. And I, I like to be fair with them, and the commissions like to be fair with them, but um, typically when they miss time, they come back looking saying, hey, we want some kind of refund on our rent. Okay. And the two golf courses. Did we do anything to prevent people from playing up at the golf courses, or they've, they've just been perfectly – maintained and everything like that so the courses themselves have been perfectly maintained i was there at both today they both look gorgeous um smith's parking lot's not ready when it is ready within the next two weeks uh weather dependent 
um, it is reduced by half there. We normally have 200 spots and we can only fit 100 with the construction. So um, and that'll go probably through the life of that, that project into November, so. And then we'll, after it's, the construction's done, we'll be able to have the 200 spots again? Yep, that's correct. Okay. Uh, let me start off with um, uh, the Smith Richardson golf course, and then we'll go back up to Carl Dick. So, with everything going on in social distancing, you're only predicting that green speeds up there will only go down by five, approximately five percent. That is correct. You don't think that there's going to be any type of social distancing still going on where? your tee times are going to have to be spread out a little further to have less play. You think everything you're predicting that the governor is going to open up and, and our health director and the first select women are going to open everything up and just say, have at it. Right now that right now we're following the PGA guidelines um, that are out there, which is what the governor issued, you know, with them uh, almost a month ago at this point. Wasn't that the, the CGSA? Wasn't that the local golf? That's, Okay. Well, there's PGA um, guidelines that they put out as well. So the CG the the CGSA is uh, <laughs> they put it out too. Um, but is I thought they restricted it a little bit where your tee times had to be a little bit more separated. Am I correct? We we're booking every other tee time is my understanding. Yep. So our tee times are nine minutes. So we're doing 18 minutes right now in right. between tee times um, for the foreseeable future. Um, we're not doing carts um, for the time being. It's walkers only or pull. Co- you'll bring your own pull cart. Um, okay. So your prediction is that those restrictions to go every 18 minutes are going to be lifted prior to July 1st? That's correct. Your res- and, uh, and you believe that everyone is going to be wanting to do golf cart rentals and sit right next to somebody? because you're only having a 3% decrease and, you know, just wanting to touch everyone's same golf cart and touch their wheel and all that stuff. This seems a little bit overly optimistic from where I know we're sitting right now, but, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm imagining people bringing sanitizer on that cart and only wanting to trap. I, I mean, I'll know I'll pay for my own cart. Yeah. I mean, it just sounds a little overly optimistic on those things. But uh, I guess that's the prediction you're making. Um, okay, now when I compare that against the revenue from the Carl Dickman golf course, um, you are predicting that it'll go down 5% at, at Smith Richardson, but you're, all, you're saying that the golf, the fees up at the Green fees will only go down 2.6 down at the par three. And what's the reason why it's only going down half as much, approximately? Um, I don't. I don't really have a, a good explanation for that one um, at this time. I'll ha- I'd have to go back and, and just go back through the numbers that we were using. All right, and on the carts, you are. The, Smith Richardson, you're going down 3.2 percent, but you're predicting that the cart fee will be down 12. No, actually, you're predicting that it'll be up yeah. 12 percent. Yeah, they've they've been up down there. There's more carts um, being used down there. Okay, so, so you're not predicting. Okay, so there's no COVID reduction for the cart fees down at Carl Dickman. Not at this point, no, not on this sheet. Okay. All right. And where you stand right now, because it's prior to May 1st, how have, how have ID card sales been compared to where they would be now? They've been down. Um, how not, much down? Not, uh, I don't have, I don't, honestly, I don't have the number in front of me, um, but I would say uh, probably in the neighborhood of 10%. And because it just seemed, I, I would think that the card sales would be, card sales would be down significantly because 
Number one, you're still going to be in a socially distanced program when you start on May 1st, so you won't be able to potentially have the same slots you previously had to be able to use the card. And then you get out to a certain point in July where people are like, why should I even buy the card? So I, I think you have a potential to have a significant loss there where people are just like, I'm not going to buy the card this year. I mean, this gets down to what right. we had, at least I had suggested at the last meeting, like maybe it would just make sense to try to get more activity up at the golf course to just allow people from Fairfield to show a driver's license for this year, try to get more people to be playing and to drive more revenue as opposed to um, forcing everyone to pay $75 when this thing might not be fully opened, the you know even under your model, be open for uh, as a normal course and regular tee times and till July 1st. So I just think there's some strong weakness in that number that might be there. Okay, that's the only questions I have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can I just dovetail off of Jim Walsh's question there. Go ahead, Mr. Go ahead, Jack. Hey, Anthony, how are you? Good, Jack, how are you? Very good. Just to get to uh, Mr. Walsh's question, we're doing that, is, correct me if I'm wrong, did I read correctly that the licenses are all that will be required at Carl Bickman and Blake Mohegan initially, or what is the plan no. for, for the immediate future? So your license can get you into Lake Mohegan or a beach sticker can get you into Lake Mohegan on the trails. Golf course is still proceeding with golf IDs for residents, or um, if you don't have one, you're a non-resident. Does that include Carl Dickman, which is that does. That's the only one that's opening May 1st, correct? That is correct. So for that one, you still need the, to get to Mr. Walsh's question to, to have paid the $75. You pay, you pay $70 for a golf ID, which gets you access for the resident rates at $7, I believe. If not, you pay $14 to play there. And you you process all that stuff online, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, so the only um, license opportunity is for access to the lake or the beach at this point. Just the lake. Just the lake. So the beach still need to have paid the ticket the for the sticker. Right. Okay, got it. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. You're All right. Thank you, Jack. Uh Mr. Walsh. And I just figured something out. So you in your model for the golf green fees where it only goes down, because I would have thought it would have gone down further than like five percent. I've now kind of figured out why it's not gone, why why you have it only going down a small amount. Because okay. you have a 36.5% reduction in your ID card. So if you're going to want to play those 36% of people, the non are really going to have to pay a non-resident rate at their taxpayer-paid course, driving up their greens fees. Is that correct? Because you got to presume that... that if your cars that's are going down, that you're going to get... Well, that, that, yeah, that, that would be the assumption here. Um, the Gulf Commission doesn't meet, unfortunately, um, until the second week of May, which is, I believe, after your vote. So, um, Well, I, I will say that I don't really think that's a fair thing that should happen in this town, and I, I would request that the first select woman get involved in that because I don't believe that just because it makes no sense to buy a card, it's not as economically viable that our taxpayers should be pay paying double, basically, to golf at well, their I, I, own course. So, well, I I respectfully disagree. The break even on a, an ID card is three rounds. So if you're going to go play more than three rounds, it makes sense to buy the ID card. That ID card gets us the town that revenue in advance of the people playing. So the people that don't buy it don't normally play more than three rounds. Yeah. If you're going to go on a one, you know, on a whim and just go play with some buddies, you play the non-resident rate because it doesn't make sense to pay the seventy dollars for the ID card. 
Um, yeah, but that's but, the Golf Commission stance on that. I mean, that's yeah, but, what the historic conversation has been. But Brenda's order, closing down the golf course and then firm, further limiting uh, socially distanced golfing, is cutting down the numbers of available tee times someone could get with a golf cart. It just is. You're shortening the season, basically. And that's no fault of our taxpayers. That's because of a pandemic and her having to take emergency orders to try to protect the town. But yet, those people get screwed because of it. Well, Jim, uh, first of all, I don't think people are getting screwed. They're playing three rounds, and they've always had that opportunity. That's what's been our process, apparently, for a very long time. You buy the cards, and you play three rounds. You, you, if you play more than three rounds, you get a discount. It's the same as always. No different. Um, it is. You've shortened the season. Frankly, 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 just a point of order, Mr. Chairman. I don't know what this has to do with the budget what the process is for the golf commission. I don't think this is budgetary in nature. <clears throat> Just possibly, possibly with the revenue. Mr. Walsh, any other questions? Uh, no, I just don't agree with the process and I think taxpayers get screwed. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Matola. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, just to follow up. I, I just want to be clear. My understanding, Anthony, is that no one right now can use the golf carts up at Smith moving for you know, for at least the next month, maybe a little longer, right? That's correct. Okay. Unless, is there an exception if you're elderly or something like that? You might be able to use there, one? There, there is an exception if they could, you know, if they have a medical condition, yes. There's absolutely an exception. Okay. And I, I got to tell you, when you open up, you know, maybe because I like to play golf, you, you're going to get a lot of people up there who want to get up there to play. There's there's pent-up frustration, and people want to get out there. And uh, so I, I, I think you're going to see a lot of rounds up there, and I think you're going to be able to do it safely. Um, um, so... Um, I think that's all I have right now. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Matola. Any further questions for Mr. Calabrese on revenue? Oh, you were almost there, Anthony. Uh, Sorry. 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 I'm not even a golfer, but I, I do. Just one quick follow-up question on the golf cart rental. Um, when, when does this end? we will be allowing carts. So, I, again, I'm assuming by July 1, um, the, restriction, the restrictions will be at least lessened to where carts will be allowed. And like Mr. Walsh was saying, um, if it's even single riders, you know, people could pay for their own carts, you know, that, that's still an option. Got it. Okay. I, and I'm so, I apologize if you said that before. So I, I missed it then. So if, if we're not allowing golf carts until – July 1, and did we already ask this and I just missed it, but we've only got the fee rental declining by 3%? Yeah, we we, yeah, we did talk about it. Yeah. We did, and I just missed it. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, what was the answer? I'm sure I won't give the same answer. Uh, <laughs> no, we, we were just, we we're, we we're assuming, my assumption is by July 1st that the uh, the restrictions were, were lifted at this point and that we will be using carts. Whether that's two people in a cart or single riders, we're still the, the fee's still the same. So if you're paying $18 for a cart now, you're going to pay 9 Okay, got it. I, I apologize. So it's one fee that you're paying for. Uh, got it. Okay. Um, okay, that was it. Sorry, sorry I missed it the first time, but thank you for re-explaining. Not a problem. Thank you. Um, Mr. Walsh. Mr. Calabrese, if we, if there's four golfers going out and they want to take carts and they wanted to beforehand do it two per cart, how much would the two carts cost the, the golfers? I believe it's $18. Um, I believe it's $18 right now for a cart that uh, two people go in. So it would be nine a piece. 
That's just for nine holes, right? Uh, no, I think that's the full 18, if I'm not mistaken. I thought it was higher than that. Uh, and if uh, everybody wants to take their own cart, so four carts go off to the same thing, how much is that? Nine dollars? We would just for a guy? That would my my initial thought again, without talking to the golf commission about that, would be that we would just divide that fee in by four. That is that the current rate now? I thought it was more if you didn't go with someone. Well, if you if you don't go with someone, you pay for the full cart right now. Yeah, you pay the eighteen. My my thought would be if we were still in this COVID lockdown, you know, social distancing. I don't think it's really fair to the golfers to double their fee for for an 18, you know, for for a cart. But again, I, this is something the golf commission would have to discuss. I I couldn't make that decision unilaterally. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay. Seeing none, Anthony. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Anthony. Okay, um, so it's, it's just us now and finance and Ms. Kupchak. So, Mr. Bremer, is there anything else on the revenue-adjusted worksheets that you would like to point out other than what we have already reviewed? Well, I'd like to go over, if possible, the the package that we sent out that's numbered in the top right corner one, two, three, and four to give you an, I want to try yeah. to give. I'm going to get overview. there. I, okay, I'm going to get there. I just wanted to see, since we're on revenue, was there anything on? We'll start We'll start on page one with your um, your tax rate. Okay. Right? No, the collection I rates. There, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's anything else on revenue we need to go over. I think, I think the, right. three, the three department heads uh, answered all the questions. Okay, so let's look at the front page then on the collection rate, the actual. We had 98.61 boxed off. So I'll let you uh, I'll let you start there. All right. Well, I think there's two important things from this list that I would like you to focus on, you as a board, Board of Finance. Obviously, we picked the lowest collection rate. We have you have to, in my mind, and maybe I'm looking at the telescope through the through the other end. But the way I look at things is before we, we, we can focus on what needs to be cut, we have to find out revenues and what are the holes and what, what, what are we trying to close here? What, how much do we need to get? And so to me, the first question and to me the most important question is what the collection rate is. Because as you all probably are very well aware, the collection rate is the largest determining factor to decide how much money the town's going to be having come in. Uh, so let's look at two things on this list. First, we picked the lowest collection rate that we've experienced throughout uh, recent memory, the last 15 years, whatever it is, uh, because we have to base it on something other than, oh, my God, the world is going down the tubes. The other thing I really noticed, I was here in 2008, and I added the little paragraph below because frankly, in 12 years, I had forgotten how bad 2008 was at the time. And when I read through that, I thought, I think that it's out of Forbes. But I would urge you all to take a read of that because 2008 was a terrible time. Uh, that whole period that I lived through here at the town. And I would also focus you on the tax rates that we experienced during those, those downturns. Now, I'm very well aware that we're trying to do everything we can to lower the tax rate. I hear you, and I agree with you. But I thought it was very interesting because, frankly, I was, I was shocked to see what those tax rates were, notwithstanding the fact, and also what the collection rates were through that time. So my strong opinion is that 9861, that's the number we should use for our collection rate. Uh, I can't, to me, there's... It's based on fact. This is the lowest rate we've ever had in the last, I don't know, 15, 16, 18 years. And in that time, certainly we had the worst economic depression until now that we had. And I would argue that 
unlike in 2008 when they did a bailout uh, for some big banks and the car companies, the spigot is open and the money's flowing to people now. And I recognize the unemployment rate is, has risen and will continue to rise, in my humble opinion. But I also believe once, once uh, things start lightening up, that unemployment rate is going to come down quite rapidly. I guess in answer to another point that's been made in the past, and, and again, in just listening to the way you are all talking, I hear the pain. Uh, I was in a corporate life, too, and I know some of you are going through real pain. All I can talk about is the facts that I have on, on my table, in my world. Uh, as I mentioned the other day, the bond refunding was a smashing success from 1-1 to 1-7. Our tax collections, which we should all be focused on, are basically ahead of schedule. The town clerk and town building are doing very, very well. And I, frankly, didn't think that in the last four weeks they would be doing nearly as well as they are. But they are. That's a fact. We got Aon's numbers on the health insurance, which I will get to a little bit later in a little more degree. Aon's numbers for the town, we picked up another $590,000 on the town side. So we're $590,000 to the good from the Board of Selectmen numbers. Uh, as I said earlier, the building revenue remains over budget, uh, and now the go we were all talking about the golf courses maybe not opening till June, maybe not opening till July, maybe not opening till August. Well, they're opening next week, and that's going to make a difference. Um, and so that's my number one. And I think I think, with all the respect, your collection rate is the, is the most it's the key number. Once we have uh, your feelings on the um, collection rate, that will make whatever scenarios and cuts, it will dictate a lot of those things. And it will make our ability to run scenarios uh, very uh, much easier because right now we're just, we're just running, you know, all different numbers until we have the collection rate. And we've talked a lot, let's turn to page two. We've talked a lot about non-tax revenue. As an overall percentage of the budget, it's really relatively small. And again, I'm looking at everything from 10,000 people. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. I, 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 on your last slide, what Are we, we were talking number going four? into this. No, number one. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, I don't disagree with your, your 98.61, uh, but the the number that we had we were going into this budget process when the world was better um, to this to this number. What kind of uh, revenue reduction? What's the number in dollars that that represents? About between our previous number in the board of selectmen budget was ninety eight eighty three, yeah. I believe, and the difference so between that number and ninety eight six one is. Is six hundred thousand dollars. Six hundred thousand. Okay. Great. Yep. Thank you. That's the decrease. Okay. Mr. Bremer, Mr. Bremer, before you move on, let's just stick with this tax collection rate and see if people have questions on it. Okay. Okay. So I don't okay. have to come back to it. All right. So are there any questions on the tax collection rate and the analysis that Mr. Bremer just reviewed with us? Um, Chris, you have another question? Mr. Yeah, Gordon? I just, I'm, I'm trying to, it, it's late, I don't want to do math, um, but is, is it true, Tom, that um, uh, a 0.2% change equals, what'd you say, 600,000? Every time we take it down 0.2? 0.2 or 0.2? I know. I don't know how linear it is. That's what I think. That's what you're really asking. Yeah. How linear it is? I'm. Part of me thinks it that is, and part of me thinks it's not. I'm not sure if it's linear. Um, we'll look at the model tomorrow. We can look at the model. Like we can give you a better sense. I feel like it's not, but <laughs> I don't think it is. I don't think it is. But okay. uh, we'll, that's fine. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. All right, Ms. Charlton. 
Yeah, and thanks, Tom. I guess the way to, to look at this, and we can look at the last 15 years or 20 years or, or whatever, but um, I'm not really sure why 2015 happened to be slightly lower than other years. That That's not necessarily logical to me, but if we just look at the most recent year, which I think is probably the best year comparison, um, we were at 98.85%. So maybe this gets to Chris's question. We're now saying that, um, and I don't know what 2020 looks like. 2019 is the last comparison we have. So we're saying that as a result of what's going on in the economy, you know, the unemployment rate, et cetera, that we expect the, the decrease in our tax collection rate to be two-tenths of a percent to $600,000. I mean, I think that's probably, you know, probably the better way to look at it. And does that, does that make sense? I mean, that's a relatively modest impact. Um, you know, well, I, 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 on, well, let me just, on, on, you know, 300 and some odd million dollars. So, I mean, that's, and it, it may be fine. I, I, I get that none of us know this, but, um, you know, the collection rates used to be 99%. They inch down a little bit. They've been a little bit lower than that for the last 10 years. We've been in the 98 point something percent range. But really, if we compare to 2019, 2020, these have been pretty good years. Unemployment's been, I don't know what, 3%. Um, you know, our grand list has been growing. The town's been booming. You know, things have been pretty good in Fairfield. So we're going from that to what feels like a pretty awful scenario right now. And, you know, I, I know what happens in April with the tax collections, but we're not talking about April. We're talking about the next couple of collection cycles when people have actually been out of work for a while and this has, you know, started to marinate. So I, I guess that's the way I look at it. And I just want to, you know, get views on that. Do we, do we think that the entire impact of this thing is going to be $600,000? In, in well, I, 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 I think in terms of the collection rate, I would, I would urge you to look at 2007, 2008, and 2009, which I think would have a much bigger impact on the town. I was stunned, frankly, to see these collection rates. And well, the reason I'm, I I'm just, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna challenge that for a minute because I think the unemployment rate is has an impact. You know, I mean, I get it. I, I hear what you're saying, but we are at more than double the unemployment than we were back then. So that that's why I feel like, you know. I'm more comfortable looking at the most recent history of where we were a year ago, and, and we can debate that, but, you know, we're basically saying that the, in, that the impact of this in its entirety is two-tenths of a percent on the tax collection rate, $600,000 in aggregate, and um, that would be pretty good if that's, if that's what it is. I'm not saying that's wrong. I, I realize that, you know, we've, we've got a a, a very high ring historically, um, but we're just, we, we, I think we do have to acknowledge that we're in a unique situation that's not reflected anywhere in these past 15 years. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that's the best way to look at it is to, to compare to the most recent year and say, do we, do we think that we've got the right level of risk reflected in there? So. Okay, thank you, Mr. Alton. Uh, Mr. Walsh? Um, the number we're looking at, the 9861, was from 2015. What major financial thing, Tom, happened in 2015 that would base us to go with that number? I have absolutely no idea why 2015 was so low. My yeah. thinking is not what caused it. My thinking was I have we have to pick a number. I mean, we could yeah. all sit around and go, why not 95? But yeah. Okay, I went to 2008 and 2009, which I thought was the biggest impact from, again, I know unemployment's going to affect our numbers, but my feeling was because all of our income, frankly, comes from real estate taxes, and we had a real estate implosion, I thought, in, in fact, that the, that the uh, collection rate in those years would be, would be dramatically different. But so I, I, I can't go with a 99 or 98.8%. I just think it's too high. So I said, well, what's the lowest number? And it looks like Sheila's having dinner. 
And I said, what's the lowest number? So I said 9861. If that's the lowest, it's that's that's what I went with. Why why was that your low? I have absolutely no idea. Could have been in the year of a revalu. I was just going to say it was a revaluation year. But but we and have we, yeah but we've had other revalu years too. So I don't I don't think that's it. And the impact. The reval occurred in 15, the budget. Yeah, yeah. If the reval occurred in 15, it's going to hit the 16 budget. 17. Or 17 budget. So I'm not sure. But we can speculate. I, I just, I have, I, I just, yeah. I have no idea. These unemployment numbers are just scaring me because they're expected, some say 30%, some say 35%, but clearly going up from where we are today. And that's going to be the biggest number that is scaring me. Um, because those, those didn't really happen in those other years to that ex nowhere near that extent in 2007 to 2009, and certainly didn't happen during Storm Sandy. Um, so it's, you know, what percentage of those people are going back? The National Restaurant Association number today, their estimate countrywide, 30% of the restaurants will not be returned. Yeah, but I, uh, you just picked the absolute worst industry. You're right. And I'm hearing that Sikorsky is hiring 500 more people. They're going 24 hours a day. They got three shifts going. If we were all sitting around and we were all in the grocery business or the internet business, we would be making more money than God or liquor business, as Brenda is whispering in my ear. So I'm not saying there's not pain out there. I, I'm, I'm agreeing completely. It's a question of how much pain, and not only how much pain, but how is it gonna affect the government? Like I have often said in the past, and I know I'm harping on the same thing, we're not a company, I don't have sales, and I don't have profits. All I've got is I've got to produce services, and I've got to produce the services that Fairfield expects. And we want to have the kind of budget that will enable the government to dig out of this mess. Because, if, because when I heard earlier about cutting many millions of dollars, I would also add that these revenue numbers that we're hoping to get, with one hand tied behind our back, we're not going to make any of those revenue numbers. If I have to start cutting all the departments, I can tell you that the rev you're, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we don't have enough to dig ourselves out of the hole, we're going to be in trouble as a government. All right, yeah, but so the, biggest numbers, the biggest number is the biggest number's taxation, right? So that's the biggest. The biggest number is the yeah, collection rate. Forget about all your other revenue numbers. That's the biggest number. Well, absolutely. All right. Um, I had a comment, but Mr. Matola, go ahead. We really need to be careful that, with with respect to how we formulate this budget, and that we do so, and I think we'll do so in a responsible way, that we don't create so much damage to this town that. People, like we talked about at the beginning of this meeting, people wanting to move to Fairfield and Westport from New York, that if we do too much damage, that we're going to not have people want to live here. That's, that's kind of my concern. I just wanted to float that out there. It's kind of what Mr. Brummer was just kind of referring to just a couple of minutes ago. So just wanted to put that out thank there. You. All right, thank you. I, you know, this is Jim Brown. I don't think that... The reductions that we're looking at, and really, honestly, what we're trying to do to move this town forward so the residents can not have a tax increase or have the smallest one that we could possibly give them is going to decimate this town. It's just it's not going to happen, okay? Because we're not talking. We're talking. Let's remember something. We're not talking about reducing the budget. We're talking about reducing the increase that was asked for. No one's saying we're going down negative 10%. So what we're looking at is what? The $11 million increase. And it's the same with the Board of Ed. No one's, no one's saying to cut the Board of Ed budget. What we're saying is we need to look at the reductions in the increase. And, and same with the town, reductions in the increase. And I also need to be careful about saying that the government and the spigots are open and the money's flowing. 
I, I, I can tell you, I, I certainly don't feel that way. First of all, I don't get a thing from the government, okay? There's no money coming to me. And second, with, with our business, the government doesn't create revenue. We have to generate revenue. We had this PPP, great, good, covered payroll for two months. And that's all it's going to do. Covers the mortgage, covers some leases, doesn't generate revenue. And basically they gave it to us so we wouldn't lay anybody off. So there was one. So I just want, you know, my course is let's just be realistic. I don't know how it affects the uh, collection rate, but I can tell you that if this economy starts to spin and, and goes in some V direction, well, then every expert is completely flat out wrong. I, I don't see that happening. 401ks have been decimated. People's incomes have been decimated, even the ones that are employed. So I, I just want to keep this real. I'm not talking about, you know, how much money's flowing to us from the government. That, that's that's the only point I have, Ms. Charlton. But yeah, I just um, and I, I appreciate what you just said, Jim. I, I think that with the real estate taxes in particular, I, I think it it might be better to think about this in terms of dollars because these percentages are. Yeah, I don't know what they mean. 98.61 isn't any better than anything else. I mean, what do we really think we have exposure for in terms of dollars? Is it a million dollars? If it's a million dollars, then that just backs into some tax collection rate. But, you know, if we look at, you know, whatever whatever variables we have, I, I think, you know, what I focused on was that this, you know, we picked a tax collection rate that came up with $600,000, and that just strikes me as a little low when we've got, you know, deferrals to give and those deferrals were provided because people can't pay their taxes. And, you know, to Jim's point, as as this starts to continue, even wealthy taxpayers in our town who, you know, a lot of people are going to be looking at significant cuts in their income. So when you have all that risk, the $600,000 just really optimistic to me, given the kind of unemployment we're talking about. And it doesn't mean that people are never going to pay those taxes, but, you know, man, if you're living in your house and you just, you know, you can wait it out until you get your job back or whatever, I mean, this is this is the number we're going to collect this year. And, um, you know, so I, I would just, you know, I, I think we do have to keep it real. There's... Um, I also appreciate what you said, Tom, about, you know, the government has put a lot of stimulus in the system, but it's only gone in a few places. I mean, unless you're in the, you know, kind of the low to median income range in this time, you're not, you're not getting your payroll replenished, but your, your income replenished by unemployment. You're just not, you know, so, so these are real, um, you know, these are real issues, and I think this is probably where, you know, we could talk about the other stuff. I know the other revenue, we've got $25 million of other revenues, whether it's parks and rec or building or whatever. We could debate that um, in a lot of different ways, but, um, you know, I, I do think this is this is the big one, and I, I think we would be smart to be a little bit more cautious in, in terms of how to do it, so I'll stop there. Well, I would just, if I may, I just want to point out, um, according to our latest projections that we, suggestions that we made, uh, we're asking, you, you mentioned earlier, Jim, about $11 million request. Uh, right now, with all the town suggestions, we're at $548,000. Now, I recognize some of that is bonding, but that's our request, it's 548. I also heard Jim Walsh say earlier we may have to cut seven, eight, nine million dollars. So um, I leave that to you to work out. My, I'm again. Uh, I hear the pain. I hear all that. I'm just telling you that we have a bit of a different perspective here in the government uh, because, well, that's all I need to say. All right. 
So we need to eventually get off this first page. I think we made our point with it. Um, are there any, you know, but Jack, you had your hand up. And I just want to keep moving through, get to the expenses, whatever page you want to get to next time. So, Jack, you have you have a question on this? I just want to make a quick statement that basically was in agreement with what Mr. Bremer was just saying and just stating that, you know, we just basically the town is suggesting we go with the lowest rate of collection in the past, is it 15 years, I think, I believe. Is that right, Tom? 15 or 20 years, yeah. 20. So I think based on that, you know, we have to start with a number, and I think that's a fair number to start with. So I wanted to say, Jim. All right, thank you, Jack. All right, Tom, where are we going next? Okay, so number two, uh, it's three pages. It just goes through. It just goes through where all the cuts have been made. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. I don't think we need to spend time on it. If there's any questions on it. These are just a listing of all the various suggestions, all the, everything that we've been talking about that has been included, the, the revenue projections on the, the three people that were just before you. This just lays it out in, so that you can read it and make whatever changes you wish. Okay, hold on before you move on, because I'd like you ready to move on. You're on number four, right? No, I'm on number two. Pay, uh, no, number two. Document two. Document two. Where are you at? Document two. Right, let, let, what document are you on? It's called non tax revenue. Number two, it says it we says non tax through. revenue. Revenue, you just went over, Jim. Move on. Okay. All right, let's yeah. move on from that. We went through that. Okay. Let's go. You want to go to, to your last. Else? How about okay, your last, last page here? Okay. Yeah. All right, so what this last page is basically doing is it's giving you if 98.6 is the collection rate that you all decide on, this goes basically through it and gives you a sense of if you want to go to 1.5, if you want to go to 1, uh, we, can, we can do it to 0 if that's, if that's desirable. But it basically gives you a worksheet where you say once once the collection rate is set, we and you and you take all of our suggestions, putting aside that you may have other suggestions and other cuts. Let's just we have to start somewhere. It's, you may have other, and, and that's fine. We're not arguing that. I'm just trying to give you a starting point so that you can say, okay, we want to do more. Yeah. Yeah. And so if if we go through this. We basically go to 9860. There's 600 unfavorable. We have our non-tax revenue adjustments, our suggestions, which is another 2.5 negative. So the total is 3.1. So that's 3.1 million. We have offset against that 4.2 million in cuts. So in effect, the debt budget impact is 1.1 favorable. So our suggestions. Again, if you take that collection rate, our suggestions in cuts outweigh all these adjustments. Okay, okay. so Tom, Tom, let's just go back then, if you don't mind, to your sure, page sure. of cuts. Let's just go back to your page of cuts. And then we'll come back to this page, all right? Because I get it. This is your starting point. This is what yeah, we asked yeah. you to do. This is what right. we asked you to do. Okay, so let's just take a look at what the... It says Board of Finance adjustments, but it's not really. It's what your yeah. It's what yeah, it's right, it's your right. request. It's your request to us. The suggestions okay. to change. That's right. All right, suggestions to us. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Charlton. Okay, and then Mr. Walsh. Yeah, thank, and thanks for providing this. I think it might be useful to just maybe frame and summarize this differently because we, we're talking about cuts, but the vast majority of this is is not cuts. Um, I just we're showing 4.4.2 million, um, of which I, I think I have this right. Two million nine hundred and sixty-seven is bonding. So there's that's not a cut at all. So if you talk about that leaves a million two sixty eight by my math. And out of the million two sixty eight, 
the majority of that is not cuts. Most of it is just changes in estimates. We got an updated estimate on health insurance. You know, we, we adjusted a, the risk management estimate. We took money out of contingency, you know, the, the interest on the bonds. I mean, these are just kind of updates. So I, I, I think this leaves roughly, um, I don't know, half a million in actual cuts. Um, which is not nothing, but I do I do just think it's important to frame that because, um, you know, we've had discussion about you know decimating our services and hurting the town and whatever, and and you know, we don't have four million dollars of cuts here. So I just I think it's important to frame that, and it would be useful I think if we I don't know if we're going to have any other iterations of this, maybe to segregate those items because the bonding is a question, you know. It, you know, bonding is still spending the money. We're just going to be, you know, paying for it over a longer period of time. Um, and these estimates, I, I don't, you know, consider these cuts. They're just updates to the budget that we didn't have in time when we originally did it. So, um, you know, I, I think it's helpful to focus on what we're actually cutting and what the impact of that is, because I do agree with what John said and Tom, what you said and what, and what Brenda said as well. I mean, nobody wants to... Um, you know, got our town services, but we close to doing that. We've basically, you know, maybe eliminated, you know, one new position that we were adding, and we've got a little bit of capital cut in some departments, and kind of that's what we're talking about. So, you know, I just just wanted to make the statement. I think it's important to frame it that way, so that we end up with a balanced view of what we've really done here. Lori, if okay, I could just you. respond to that, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I again uh, taking, you know, whenever I, whenever I do anything, I look to others to see what they're doing. And I've been in a lot of conversations, and I'm assuming you're all reaching out to your counterparts in other towns as well. And again, I, I mentioned this earlier. Other towns are bonding. They're bonding, and we cut police cards. We cut things that we wanted in the budget. And I did speak to the police department, and they said to me that was unprecedented. No one has ever, not even in 2008, when people hit the skids and were losing their jobs, and I personally had to lay off half of my workforce and my business in 2008, did, did they ever cut police cards. So we have made cuts. We have made adjustments to the budget. We're doing the best we can. And to, put, to say to put $3 million in bonding is not an unusual thing when every other town is doing that and because money is so incredibly cheap to bond right now and we just sold off 1.7 of our debt so it just makes sense to do that instead of decimate the town why not bond it and again the, uh, m many of these towns are using some of their fund balance so they're mixing it up they're taking some out of the town like we are we, they're cutting some board of ed stuff, they're bonding, and they're using fund balance. That's what they're doing. So, I mean, I'm not, we didn't make this up on our own. Other people are doing that. We have 169 towns, and some of them are AAA, uh, so they can't really bond or they don't have a fund balance because they're a small town and they just don't have the, the economics to do that sort of thing, and, but we do, and again, this is, this is what, I mean, I'm on phone calls all the time talking to these towns. Their board of finance chairs are on them. Their finance departments are on them. Their HR people are on them. We're all on them, and we're all talking, and, and this is what people are doing. So no, I, I just, I wanna, I, I'm just going to, listen, I, I never, I did not say, I don't want to imply that I'm necessarily opposed to bonding non-traditional items in a year like this. My point was only that that's not a cut. That's all I wanted to say, that we keep talking about cuts of $4 million, and we have not cut anything close to that. And so I think the, the fear and the concern about, you know, the impact to services and everything else, I just want to segregate this because the vast majority of what's on this page is not, in fact, a cut at all. So that was my only point. And I think that's important because I think none of us are looking to gut services or gut education or anything like that. But, you know, we, you know, just, just, try, just trying to understand that we've got a, a list of things here that are, 
the nature of these things is very different, and it's all mixed up into one pot, and we're calling it cuts, and, and really what it is, and that was my only point. So, so I, I have to be sure. No, 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 Jack, don't do that. Well, I, I have a point of order. I, is there a question? We have a question. Yeah, there was a question. The question was, where are the cuts as opposed to the bonding and as opposed to the reductions right, in uh, the health insurance? That that was the question. Yeah, and also a suggestion that perhaps we can segregate these things so that we can see the impact of things like cuts versus just changes in estimates or bonding, because they are they're very different um, financial impacts and and so. Yeah, we did how we did. No, this is in department order. Yeah. I'm sorry, who's speaking? Who's Linda was speaking. No one, no one. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right, thank you, Mrs. Charlton. Uh, you know, just one, one point is as we look at these reductions, this is not a one-year problem. We're not just going to go through this budget and say, okay, everything's behind us and let's move forward. This next year is going to be here in eight months, and we'll be looking at the same issues, okay? And if we just sit there and do everything, um, we just bond non-traditional and we just bond this, and, and, and I get it, we are going to bond what we normally don't bond, but if we go too far, we're going to have a cliff next year, and that cliff is going to be huge. So... There's got to be reductions in this budget, and we're going to make reductions in the increases, okay? And we'll go through them with you. Some of these are fine, what you propose, in my view, and others, we're going to have other ideas, okay? And, you know, one of the things that, that me personal, what I'm trying to avoid, is that we make decisions this year that puts us in jeopardy next year, more than, you know, we could possibly handle. And we will do that if we create a huge cliff. Okay, fund balance. Absolutely and right. bonding. We absolutely, absolutely agree. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. DeWitt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chris DeWitt. So uh, I was going to, I was basically going to say the same thing you just said, because um, I want to, add on to what Ms. Charlton saying. This is a list of deferrals, right? We're not cutting anything here. We're, we're bonding paving for a year, but all these positions that are in, they're all coming back. Next year, somebody's going to want them. So my big concern is just as, as, as Mr. Brown portrayed it. We're going to be sitting here a year from now wondering why we have a 5 6 7% budget increase in front of us. And um, the, these deferrals, rather than reductions, are, are will be the reason why that is. So, thank you. Okay. So, you know what? Thank you, Mr. Dewey. And, and Mr. Bremer, I know this is a starting point. And, again, I'm not, I appreciate you putting this together. It's, we're going to have to come to a, um, you know, a conclusion here at some point, and we're going to vote, and we're going to have to – not look at this thing as a three month problem. That that's all my that's that's my point. Okay. Thank you, right, Mr. Walsh. Um, first of all, Mr. Chairman, um, a lot of people see tonight are making Robert's rules um, motions for points of order, and I, I just want to be clear about what that is because you know a point of order may be raised only if the rules have been broken and, and people seem to be making this you know points of order all night long that's the only reason something could be interrupted so i just want to be clear as we go forward that people are making the right motion um next in regards to the asphalt paving you're asking us to cut two million dollars the entire budget and to bond it something that this board deliberately got away and it took us a, a, a while to wean us off of that um, to the first select woman, are you making a promise that if we do that, that you're going to put the $2 million back in the budget next year? Because that's going to create quite a cliff for you. Well, we, I'm, not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it will. I mean, 
we have a choice, I guess. We can either bond it or we can not pave it all this year. Okay. I mean, all right. Because I think that if that line goes away in the budget book, the $2 million goes away. Do you know how hard it is to replace that number for $2 million or whatever we're supposed to bond next year? It is extremely hard to replace that number. And, and I don't know everybody else, I was, feels, I was under but it the took a long time. I'm in the middle of talking, Brenda. But it takes it's taken us a long time, and as a deliberative body, this body has made the decision that paving is an operating expense. It's not a capital expense, and it's something that we pay for because it's something that we pay have to do every year. And at the end of 15 years, we're promised that we will have done all the roads in town, and we have to start all over again. So we made a long a long term decision. And in regards to paving, we weren't going to just bond it every year because at some point in time, you're just paying the amount that you're supposed to pave plus you're paying the interest on it. So, you know, I understand about it in a difficult year, but to take an entire line item of $2 million out, it's just, it's just very difficult to do and create a tremendous cliff for next year. Um, Brenda, do you have any recommendation to us about cutting the Board of Education line further? Or do you not want to cut it further? Well, um, I, Jim, I'll say that I was not through your whole meeting that you, as the uh, Board of Directors, were listening to the Board of Education's proposal. It was my understanding from conversations with some of your members that the Board of Ed identified saving due to being closed, and that Absolutely. your board is making a consideration of cutting the amount that they deem that they say. So I, that's what I'm going on. I don't have control over the Board of Ed. I only have control over showing you what I can do and what scenarios I could offer to you. Okay. You may cut and I'm to the board of ed. That the board of ed also did that for you guys. That they said, here's some areas where you can make reductions in our budget. They didn't say that to us. They didn't say that to us at all. Well, I, um, I did, so I'm assuming they would. They're two thirds of the budget. No, I'm just saying that that night when they made their presentation, they weren't telling us that we could make a cut or that they would accept a cut or, or would would be willing to go along with it. So did you ask them? Did you what. ask them? Did you yeah. ask them? Yeah. We did. Go? We did. It didn't it, it didn't go well. That's why we're probably at least some of us, I don't know whether all of us, are gonna have to go out of like in our own direction, kinda like we are with the town as well. So it's it's just they're not willing to give it up. They asked some of the same questions. They said, you know, we they, they had proactively started meeting with their union um, in advance of our meeting with them. And the question the union they told us was coming back to them are, is the town unions willing to give concessions if we give concessions? And that's why we made a motion that night that we would ask you to get into negotiations with them to show that we thought it should be a shared uh, sacrifice. Right, so I talked to Hazel Camp about that, and again, 35 years of experience, he said he's never heard of any, the town, one, the town saying that they were looking what the Board of Ed was doing, or the Board of Ed was looking for the town to make, they were, he's never heard of that. And, and I, maybe that's a nice thing to say, to say that we're not gonna do it, um, but again, neither the town nor the Board of Ed will, I mean, they could say they're in negotiations, but nobody's going to have a negotiation before the budget passes. It's, it's, okay. I mean, I mean, I know he says that. I mean, we, we all have to deal with what we're dealing with, which is something that hasn't happened since the Spanish flu in 1918. And Mr. Hayes, Mr. Your, your HR director wasn't there then, thank God. I know, but to um, say but, that they're not going to negotiate, they're not going to even talk to their unions unless the town does. It's like, I'll do what you want. I'm not going to do it until he does it. I'll jump I think, if you jump. No, I mean, it's I, I, fun. I, I, no, <laughs> no, I, the, the, no, they, 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 what they said was, they said that they had met with, I can't remember the gentleman's name who heads those unions, 
but yeah, and they I'm said sure that they he understood <laughs> that he understood that he said that he had understood the issue and that they were going to continue the conversation. But one of the things he was being, you know, the uh, superintendent was being asked was, you know, are you going to do it on the town side? And to me, I think it's going to be shared. It's going to be a shared uh, sacrifice. So you know, that's that. Um, well, well, based on. Based on, this is Tom, based on your earlier conversations with Hazelcamp, yep. you're absolutely right. If, if, if both sides, look, if, if he's really going to ask for zero from, from the unions and there's no reason not to believe that, I assume they will do the same on the Board of Ed side. Yep. Um, all right. And can you find? Can you guys find out in Fairfield County how many of the towns plan on using? You said you talked to a number of different people on your call. How many different towns are going to be using bonding in Fairfield County to bring down their budget? I'm sorry. What was that question? How many towns in Fairfield County plan on using bonding to bring down their budget? I talked the towns I talked to today. We're all doing it. There were six or five on the line. What towns were they? Um, Stratford, Greenwich, Trumbull, Westport, and Monroe. Bridgeport was on the line too. Some of those were using fund balance. Some hadn't decided yet. Yeah, Greenwich just knocked down. I think it was Saturday. They Greenwich just knocked about their what their equivalent is to the Board of Finance. I think it's well, Greenwich is know. different because they have a huge grand list, and they were already at a zero before the pandemic hit because they have such a high grand list. Um, but they yeah, they cut their Board of Ed. I think it was three million. I talked to them it today. Cut or the rest of the town basically down at last year's numbers. Their town size. Yeah, I think they were like at a point two. Point two. They but they cut literally. They cut the town side down to the number that was last year's number after cutting the board of it three million dollars. Yeah, and, and Fred Camillo has seven people in his front office. Yeah. I'll and take, a whole team of lawyers who works for the town. I'll take their budget. Uh, not to, not to pile, you asked earlier about the Board of Ed, not to pile on too much, uh, but let me pile on a little bit. On their last sheet that I have in front of me, which is their, basically their Excel sheet where it talks about 2.562 million in savings. In the health insurance, which, which, we asked Aon to update our health insurance, which I talked about earlier. He also gave me the final numbers on the Board of Ed. And because in the earlier conversations between the Board of Finance and the Board of Ed, which I listened to on Fair TV, they were talking about their health insurance number instead of an $800,000 savings was going to be cut by $340,000 which is in line 11 of their projected balances. They took the 340 out of it. And I confirmed with Aon, I guess it was it yesterday or the day before, that Aon said, no, that number's still good. So actually they, they knocked it down to 330, I believe. So that 340 negative is really a 330 positive. Which means instead of two five six two, it's really two nine that their savings will be. All right, you know what? I, 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 stay on. Okay, great. I, I the board of ed is going to come before us on Tuesday. Why don't we cut? Why don't we talk about the board of ed on Tuesday when they come before us? No problem. And, okay, and we'll get their numbers. And look, they know, they know that further reductions are coming. Okay, and as Jim said, they talked to their union. At least that's what they said. I'm sure they're going to continue to speak with them, and we'll get a update from them on Tuesday. All right, Mr. Walsh, you have anything else? Not right now, thank you. All right, let's move on from the expense pages. 
Tom, next page, you, you were starting, you ended up at 4.2, favorable. Right, and I have to go. Yeah. Right, so, so again, uh, 4.2 expenditure offsets leaves the net budget impact of 1 1. And what we basically did was, was we calculated, okay, assuming that those numbers are accurate, and we can argue over those numbers, what does it mean? That produces a 2.46. What does it mean to get it down to 1.5? And that's how we added 2.3 in the 1.1. One one. You need another million, 1.2 million, if you take our cuts. If you want to get to 1.0, then you need 2.6 million in addition to our cuts. If you want to get to zero, uh, zero, I'm guessing it's approximately 6.5 million in addition to uh, our suggestions. So I mean, it's a baseline. I'm, tr I'm trying to give you a sense of what we're talking about in order to end this conversation in a positive way. <laughs> well, thank you. Good Thank you, Mr. Reimer. Okay, <laughs> let's see if we can let's see if we can keep it that way, uh, Mr. Dewey. Yes. So I'm in basic agreement with the numbers. I mean, I, I've been doing very simplistic math. The budget last year was three sixteen point four, and now this year it was at three twenty seven five. So it's eleven point one million dollars with no other adjustments. So if you think the numbers tend to get to zero, um, I'm, I'm tracking with you, 10 or 11 million to get to 0%. But I don't know if you've got four, you know, I don't know if that, that four you're projecting is, 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 is real. And again, it is more of a deferral, but I'm, I'm tracking with you in that 10 to $11 million range just on base numbers. All right, thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Any questions on this yeah. page, just page only? Yeah, yeah, I would say that's probably close, Chris. I mean, yeah, I mean, if we ask for 11 total and you want to cut 11, you'll probably be right around zero, I would think. All right, any other questions on this page? Okay, moving on. Um, one last page for tonight, I think, maybe two. Ms. Bossi. It brings us to 2020, the executive summary, revenue, expenses, and the estimated increase in fund balance. This is the latest based on um, the openings of uh, Park and Rec and other additional information you've had since last week. This is a document we pushed off a week. So if you could just take us through the revenues. You guys have this projected net estimated operational variance? No. Uh, uh, sorry, Jim, when, was that sent via email or was it posted? Yeah. No, that should have been in the it's same right package. Above the document we were just talking about. Okay. Yeah, keep going. I'll find it. Sorry. Yeah, it's called. You, you got it, Mr. Matola. You got it. Yeah, it's called 427. It's called 42720 backup for special board of finance meeting. Okay. Yeah. All right, Caitlin, take us through the revenue. Okay. Um, some of these numbers you've seen before, and um, there's just a couple. The biggest one being the, the park and rec revenue um, of the negative 541 that came from Anthony, which is the clearly the announcement today with the open spaces opening up May 1st. The rest of it is, um, again, numbers you've seen before, current prior year, you know, we're, we're collecting. I left the negative 700 in there, which, which Gets, gets, I used a low collection rate, I, again, and we still had that, that tax sale revenue to make up. So we're tracking it every day. This is, um, 
you know, a guess at this point. Investment income, I left as flat, uh, same assumptions that um, the rate's gonna stay where it is right now. So I'm, I'm leaving the budget number in there. Again, building revenue, we've, we've, you've talked to Tom Conley about it, it's about 400 or so coming in over budget this year. State aid, again, is tracking where it's been tracking basically all year. Um, park and rec revenue, the, the 541 coming straight from Anthony with the assumption that everything, or not assumption, with the actual that uh, the open spaces are opening up Friday. Fire marshal fees, uh, again, I think the fire um, chief reiterated around 410 to 4, could be up to 450. And there's some other smaller ones, ins and outs, that you've seen on the other quarterlies as well. So we're projecting about a negative revenue of the 605, which again, every day I'm looking at revenue to see the main driver of that is the negative 700. All right, any questions on uh, Ms. Trollman? Thanks, Caitlin. I'm sorry, I'm sorry if you said this and I missed it, but with that negative 700, what, what is the collection rate? Inclusive. Well, that is actually, I've actually used a 98.61, but I know that we've clearly, we were, we were much higher than that through, what, nine months out of the year, but we still had the tax sale revenue to make up for of the million dollars, so we had some money in there, so I really, you know, could it be negative 500? I'm not sure, you know, really every day I'm just, I'm looking at my cash coming in. We'll have a much better sense of that number next week. Yeah, we're hoping Tuesday. I've been talking to the tax collector. He has some mail to open. This is a big week for him. Um, he says, you know, they, the people that are kind of still on their old practice of paying by May 1st, he's thinking he's going to see a lot in the mail, possibly credit card payments up till, you know, 4 o'clock on, on May 1st. They could put it in the mail with no penalty, the ones who are still again, acting under the old rules. He's hoping to have an update by Tuesday. I told him we're gonna see where we are to see what that collection rate really looks like. And I wanted to add one more thing. Uh, we were concerned about the deferment plan. And so part of the deferment plan is the landlords. The landlords have to file uh, an application for deferring uh, their rent. And his sense is, and this is for what it's worth, his sense is, that he doesn't really think a lot of people know about the deferment program because if, if the landlord numbers mean anything, he's only had 15 applications. He, he thinks that we have a couple thousand landlords in town, and he says we've only had 15 applications for the deferment program from the landlords. So I don't know how that factors into anything, but that's his sense that maybe a lot of people are not going to be taking advantage of the deferment program. But again, We'll have a much better sense. Uh, I hope to have a much better sense on Tuesday as to what uh, what kind of taxes we've collected through May first. Hey, hey, Tom, he might not have wanted you to say that, <laughs> but okay. But just, yeah, just to maybe. clarify, though, Caitlin's point, and I, I'm, I'm not sure I followed you. If this seven hundred thousand dollars shortfall is in fact what the number is. What that equates to a 98.6 collection rate? Is that, is that what you said? Or what does that equate to in terms of collection rate? The 98.61? Yes. Okay. So right now your current, you know, again, I realize this is changing every day, but if this were to, to pass, that means that 2020 would be equivalent to our kind of worst collection year that we've ever had. Well, don't forget, we're also making up for that tax sale that was budgeted in 20 that we didn't do. Yeah, and, and that's a good point. What, and I don't want to monopolize the discussion here, but with regard to next year and tax sales that we can do or not do, is that something that you've re-looked at in the analysis or have you, I thought you just left the number the same. Would we be more aggressive or less aggressive on tax sales, do you think, in the upcoming year? 
Does that have well, right, a, what is a couple million dollars of, of an impact? Well, right itself? now, right now, the, the state of Connecticut, the governor has forbid any tax sales from going forward. So it's kind of off the charts right now. Now, right. in terms of moving, in terms of moving forward six nine months from now. Um, I think it's something that's open for discussion. We haven't factored it into the budget uh, because because of a lot of the comments I heard earlier about what's going to be happening in six or seven months. We're doing everything we can to lower the tax rate, and it's kind of an antithesis to say, okay, now we're going to take your house away from you because you're not paying the taxes. I mean, we're kind of talking out of both sides of our mouth. So. No, no, I'm, so, I'm, that's my point, Tom. Are we, I'm, I was trying to understand what the strategy was, because right now we have prior year taxes, interest, lien fees in the budget of three, $3.3 million, right? That's on the top sheet. So that does that assume there are no tax sales for next year? Correct. We did not budget a tax sale in 21. We are not budgeting for a tax sale. Okay. So we assume, and I, I agree. I mean, I assume that at least for the short term, you know, right. we weren't doing anything, but I didn't know if we've had people who've been delinquent for many, many years. Like, I, I don't know what our universe is of um, past due taxes and how many of those may have been outstanding for, you know, a, a period of time predating this pandemic. So, but, but that's helpful to know. So right now there's nothing in there at all. Correct. Okay. And Caitlin, your point was we... 98.6, but we're getting, you know, based on your current forecast, but that's, but what we budgeted had assumed how much more tax in there that we never did? There was a $2 million tax sale budgeted in 2020, and we've collected, without the tax sale, there was sales of almost a million dollars early in the fall, hence the decision not to go forward with the tax sale, but so we still had a million dollar hole to make up as well. So we had a million dollar hole and right now we think we're seven seven hundred thousand dollars short. So we're actually three hundred thousand dollars ahead if you want to think of it that way. Is that in terms of current, yeah. 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 Okay. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any questions on revenue? Further questions, uh, Mr. Walsh. Uh Caitlin, on the current and prior year levy and interest, so there is no change in that number from the numbers you previously presented despite the fact that there's going to be a deferral? Well, there is a deferral, and we're seeing collections still coming in. You think your assumption is, is that all that money will come in by June 30th that was due on April 1st? Well, I'm saying we're going to be 700 short in those three categories. In which three categories? Current, prior, and interest. Okay, so you think all the money will come in despite the fact that the, that we did do the deferral after you'd already estimated the 700? Well, the 700, coincidentally, is the 98.61 as well. So I said, you know what, we, we, we know we were higher than that for nine months out of the year. From July through March, we were on target except for the tax sale. So we're still seeing we're still seeing these payments come in. We will have a better sense next week. So I left the 700 knowing that we still had some prior year hole to fill, and and we're doing pretty good on our collection. I mean, I don't know. Right. Would you be provided be able to provide us by the end of next week um, what happened with last next week with that collection, whether they're tracking at tonight the the rate that you have them tracking at. Yeah, so, we, sure. so we're hoping on Tuesday, I'm hoping, like I said, the tax collector is, has some mail to open. We're expecting a lot to come in May 1st, and that's credit card stuff. But what happens on May 1st is they can put it in the mail, right, and it's still not late under the old rules. Yes. So it could sit at the post office all weekend. I don't know what their timing is with quarantining mail, so I'm not even sure when it's going to get here because we also quarantine on our side as well. So I'm hoping, I mean, we'll see where we are. All right. So you get mail and then you guys hold on to it for a certain number of days quarantining it? Yeah, I think it's 24 hours. 48, 48 hours. hours, sorry. Brenda just said four, it's 48. Okay. Well, could you report to us on Friday about where those numbers stand? Because that should give it enough time to clear everything. 
Oh, the next Friday. Oh, the following yeah. Friday, not this yep. Friday. Yeah. No, not this, not this Friday. No, 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 no. Right. So follow a yep. week from, a week from Friday. Yep. That'd be great. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Walsh. Let's go to expenses. Okay. Um, personnel savings, which we've been seeing all year, um, offset by, so Anthony had a $105,000 savings number um, that was associated clearly with the loss of revenue as well. So we have that embedded. We have the part-time savings. Um, and again, where it's mostly, it's half of its library, um, part-timers that have been laid off and some operational regular quarterly type of things that we're, that we're still tracking and I'm putting on for the quarterly. Not a lot though on, on that respect has changed. And this clearly does not keep in mind any COVID expenses. Right, which so is I'm another document. Know. I'm sorry, go ahead. That's another document, right? Yeah, so I mean, really this, I was trying to keep COVID separate from operational, which is kind of hard to do because I have a lack of revenue, this 541 that's COVID related, and I have expense savings that are COVID related, yet I'm tracking COVID expenses on the separate chart. So does this number include that COVID expenses? No, so this is the COVID savings that Anthony's having related to his revenue loss of 541, right? So he has some savings that there's gonna be no lifeguards and stuff until July 1. So he has 105 in savings that's embedded in that other number. Along with, we have part-time savings. And then some operational savings. So what this is showing is, in effect, it's the net estimated variance is is close to zero, with approximately our budgeted contribution um, coming down to increase fund balance or get moved, or that's where we think we're going to approximately end up as of as of today. And I, and I would just like to add, just a few weeks ago, we wrote a memo saying. We didn't think we'd have anything drop down to the bottom line, and we were, we were saying we were going to be at 10.984 or something like that. But in just the spate of a couple of weeks, we're seeing the markets re rebound. We're seeing a lot of savings. So now, and I think it's unfortunate, frankly, our uh, bo fund balance, if, this, if the numbers in this sheet are accurate at the end of the year, Will will rise to 11.4 percent when we thought we were going to be. I'm sorry. How does it raise to 11.4 when we had a budgeted surplus of 1,330,000, which was which I believed was the number that was just to do no harm to the fund balance. Hi, Jim. 1330, we the, the 1330 budget for the that we budgeted last year was to do no harm to the fund balance. That's the reason we put that in there, and that's what we make you budget. Correct, Linda? Yes. 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 Okay, so that's there. And now we're just going to have a slight increase of 8.7. And how do we get it now? Fund balance raises so much. Jim, this is what happened. That, uh, that fund balance projection for the end of 20 of 10.9 Four eight or eight four, I don't recall the exact number, was a combination of two things. Dropping approximately one million to the fund balance because we thought we were not going to have the full one million three thirty, and a second occurrence. We're reducing the denominator because our expenses are going to be reduced by that seven hundred thousand that Caitlin is talking about on her sheet. It's actually 692, I just used 700 round figures. So, so what happens is your numerator increased and your denominator decreased. That caused the larger swing in that ratio 
that we refer to as the fund balance percent. All right, I can talk to you offline about that. Sure. Okay, so go ahead, Caitlin. Are you finished um, up? I think, I think that's about it in terms of uh, the fiscal 20 estimate. As to Tom's point, these numbers, you know, change. Uh, so right now, we're at, we're at 1417, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. And then we have this other sheet that you put together, so we might as well look at it real quick, and that is the um, COVID-19 directly related expense. You have it by department. You're saying the total COVID expense to the town is 210,000. Uh, to date, yeah. to date, yeah. yes. So what we're doing is we're um, asking the department heads pretty regularly to update what their COVID expenses are. Um, so as you can see, it's by department. So this was as of April 15th. What we know is FEMA does not reimburse for regular pay, so we've taken the regular pay column out of our total. That leaves us with like 121 reimbursable expense. The FEMA rate is the 75%, so if you take that off, that gets to about 30,000. And again, now we have this unemployment comp number out here that again, who's gonna file, when are they gonna file, is is up in the air and we know through the CARES Act that that's at a 50% reimbursement right now. So again, this number literally changes every day as well as the department heads feed us their information. We're tracking everything through, through payroll. We have a separate pay code associated with it. Um, so this is where we are as of last okay. week. So 75% FEMA reimbursement. Mm -hmm. When do you apply for that? How does that work? Um, I have someone on my staff who's been getting, she's been going to training through FEMA and she's now on a, she had a tutorial and you have to log into the grants portal. Um, I'm not sure of the exact date as to, as to when the actual claim gets submitted. We're still, we're yeah, still, I mean, we're running. still tracking. We're still tracking because so. we're still spending. So it's are you going to wait for a while? All right, you're going to wait to the end and do it one time. Yep, that's the plan. You should do it. And, oh, sorry, go ahead, Tom. I was going to say not to poke a sleeping bear, but the budget doesn't have anything in it about the CARES Act, whether or not revenue is enhanced from the feds or anything like that. I mean, we can all we can all argue over it, but the quick answer is we didn't put anything in the budget. So if you right. think we'll not get anything, we're all set. If we get something, it'll be to the good. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dewitt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chris Dewitt. So I, I'm looking at these expenses, and like police department, I get it, you know, overtime and 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 all, but I'm surprised. Well, listen, I'll ask this way: what what did we what did we spend thirty five thousand dollars in public works that were direct COVID related costs? I mean, if anything, we're not doing stuff in parks and recreation, right? Yeah. Um a lot of that as you can see is 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 payroll. Oh I'm sorry, wait, oh park so and rec. You're talking about more. sorry, sorry, I was looking at no no, hold on, I'm sorry. Oh re, do you know what that recreation is? Um yeah, I believe. No, actually, I'm looking at public works operations. Oh, public. Okay. Public works is working. They are out working. So yeah, sixteen thousand of theirs is is regular payroll. So they're working more because of COVID. I think they're working on COVID-related stuff. What uh, is what I think, but frankly, uh, we're guessing. See, that I mean, number. What see, kind of stuff? Public works. So. Public works operations, okay, I can, I guess I could kind of see, but recreation and registrar of voters, really? <laughs> I mean, it's 300 bucks, but still. Are you working for the federal government? Are you questioning the veracity of these numbers? I'm just curious why 
<laughs> recreation department is charging is is has any COVID related expenses? Well, I believe a lot of their time, like this is a regular payroll time, is now um, filing or what should I uh, processing refunds for all of their parties. So I believe that's why it's sitting in their regular payroll line is an inordinate amount of time is processing refunds for all of the canceled events down at Jackie and at Penfield. Perfect. Yeah. And they're doing a lot of beach stickers right now. Tremendous amount. Okay. Well, now, now, they, now they are. They weren't doing those up to April 15th. This is as of April 15th. And, and it's the refunds. I've been seeing money come out of the account because people want their money back on their credit card. So a, a, a big amount of time, I believe, and I could ask Anthony, is related to the processing of all those refunds. And the canceling of any programs or anything else that's, that's happened. It's a lot of money. And again, it's regular payroll, though. I mean, I, I believe his staff is he's all working on this. All right. Uh, Ms. Johnson, we, we have not, just so you know, we haven't reviewed all the filings that are going to be required. We haven't reviewed all these these time submittals. We've asked all the departments to put together what they believe are COVID-related expenses. And obviously, before we file, we'll go through it all. We'll see what's justified. And if something's not justified, we're not obviously not going to file for it. But we'd be guessing as to what each individual thing is. So I just would add, for example, the police officers that will have, um, you know, patrolling for there's overtime costs that we could submit. There's overtime costs for some of, um, you know, of our uh, first responders who have been collecting PPE and uh, doing things for our nursing homes, things of that nature. We've already been collecting those um, in a file as well. Okay, um, I just need to go to Ms. Charles. We're gonna have to kind of almost I think we only have about 15, 20 minutes before our WebEx time is up. So, Lori Charlton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, um, I know we've been asking a lot of questions about regular payroll, but Caitlin, you explained that's an allocation that's not going to get reimbursed anyway. So, um, Correct. I, the question I did have, though, is on the unemployment comp expense to the town. And I guess I'm so we can re even though we've had savings of the payroll that led to that unemployment. Yes, through the CARES Act, if there was a layoff or furlough associated with COVID, they are reimbursing 50%. They're reimbursing. Okay, wow. Kind of surprised. There's a real. This is part of the part of the craziness in my mind. There's an incentive to lay people off, and so. And I just and wanted so, to make sure that that was okay. So the 180, then is that the amount? that we expect to get reimbursed, or is that the gross amount of the expense? Um, that's what our expense would be. Okay, so we, so, we, so we have a half of that, right? So a net of nine, so 90 plus the 30 is what this is costing the town thus far? So we have savings of about 500. Anthony had another hundred or so, right? So if we just do employment is 60% of that, and these are rough numbers. So that's like 380,000, then it was 50% of that. It's going back to the 180. Because some of these savings, like for the Registrar of Voters, they had a primary that's, that's gonna be moved to August. You know, these are seasonal workers. I'm not even sure that they would be eligible A and B, whether the Registrar of Voters, I would think, would ask us to reappropriate that money going forward since they're going to have that expense in next fiscal year. So a lot of these are, are ballpark park figures. Yeah, no, I hear you. I, it's not, thankfully, it's not a lot of money. It does beg the question. I mean, obviously, we don't have anything in the budget for next year. And, you know, we can throw everything we want in the pot, but whether whether it ultimately is eligible for reimbursement is 
you know, I guess a question. So we'll probably get back, you know, money for some of these things and, you know, some right, will get right. questioned. But, um, but, you know, so but just to be clear, the 30000 is a net number, but the 180 is a gross number. So if I'm trying to figure out the total net to the town, would it be 30 plus 90? Well, that's what that total is, that 210. So it would be the 180 because that would be our cost. So it's really and three. Then, are you saying? I thought you said no, the one. Saying, so on the sheet, it has the 180. So we had the 30,000, which was the expense to the town left over. In theory, if 75% of the costs are reimbursed, I'm, I'm leaving the 180 in there because that's the town cost. That's half of what, because um, our employment cost would be like the three, 360 or so, but half of that would be getting back. Okay, so the 180 so, is not a gross number. That's the 50% that we are. Correct. Correct. That we're yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay. So it's two, that was, that was costing, Okay, so 210. So again, and this is a couple of months worth of expense. So I guess it's worth asking the question if we're next 210 of expense, we don't at the moment have anything in next year's budget for costs that may continue uh, related to this. It's, I mean, it's not millions. Correct. Yeah, I believe unemployment was bumped up as a proposal. Yes, yeah. It was. Okay. All right. That, oh, that's, that right. that's the 250000 right. your Right, right, right. That's, that's gotcha. the only difference. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Hey, Kelly puts me on mute, and I don't know it. I must be making my computer must be buzzing around. So, Mr. Walsh, go ahead. What's the overtime for for the fire department for the COVID? I'm going to have to, I, I would have to ask them, but I think some of it has to do with the incident command meetings that they have. Well, maybe so, not, because I'm not sure if that would be so at the lower I, level. I, I, thought I, the, I, thought, I thought the chief's on a salary. Yeah, no, he is. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'd have to ask. I don't know. Yeah. Can we get a breakdown of that? And I get a breakdown of the, the police overtime seems to be out of control when there's no crime going on in town. And we haven't even started Brenda's thing about having them go down to the beach to monitor the beach. Yeah, I mean, and, and again, these, these numbers are all changing. I guess I can get you a general feel for what they're doing because clearly this probably already changed from last week. I mean. Yeah, could we get it as of May 1st and get – a listing of each department, like, like I'm not going to ask for all departments, fire department, police department, what they were doing during this time. It's just like public you know, works. Public works. I mean, is that to put the boulders out all over town? Well, there are signs everywhere. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Boulders. We'll find out. We'll find out. I mean, we're going to go through all of these clearly before we, like Mr. Bummer said, <laughs> No, but I mean, it's, 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 it's and worth they're changing it. every day. I, I know, and what my fear is is that the police department's going to get up to over a hundred thousand dollars very quickly by by May fifteenth, or maybe even higher. Okay. So I mean, I think we got to get an explanation for what all this overtime and stuff is for. I mean, the best deal going seems to be the health department. For all they seem to be all over the place. So they're working their butt off. I know, and it's, I mean, look at that. It's only $3,800. But there's only three or four people in that department as opposed to 100 firemen. Well, and they don't have cops, guns but... either. They don't have you guns, guys, you know. But I'll, I'll tell you, you and drive they don't, this... and, they don't, and they don't have 109 vehicles either. But you drive through this town at night, you can't find a cop. It's a ghost <laughs> town. <laughs> I mean, seriously. <laughs> That's because they're all down at the beach. <laughs> all right, all right, wait a second. Oh, uh, all right. We got a hand we're going to cut off. Why, why, is the, uh, why is the legal right. COVID number, like, can we get an explanation for what this $23,000 number is for legal? I believe he's interpreting every executive public? order coming from Lamont. He's, in, he's interpreting every executive order that's coming from Lamont and what it means to us. But, I mean. Oh, so that gig. Yep. All right. Anything else on this? Luckily, this is the last worksheet. Yeah, no, yeah, just a quick comment. We should right, quick comment, back. quick comment, then we got to get. 
have to, we should put, we should make sure we have timely and really robust explanations for this stuff because yeah. it will get challenged, particularly things like overtime. I mean, I, I think we're going to probably be challenged to provide a direct correlation. And so if we don't keep that contemporaneously, um, it, there will be risk to, to getting reimbursed for any of it. Yeah. But you should emergency, keep track of everything. The emergency operation commands. That's all. That's all related to a pandemic, and that's disaster relief under emergency orders. So the chief's getting all this extra money. I mean, what is it? No, I'm just saying some of this activity is due to the pandemic, and that would be attributable to disaster relief funding. Okay. I think we got a better explanation of these numbers. We'll get it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's that's the last document, and so that's about it for tonight. Caitlin, did I miss anything? I hope not. No, I think I think that was all we had. Okay. All right. So we meet again on Tuesday, and on Tuesday uh, we'll take the vote on the fill pile, and we have the board of ed coming in. All right, and. So the Board of Ed will talk about the non-lapsing account. Uh, there'll be an MOU we have to put together. Insurance update that we reviewed earlier. Where they might be on union discussions, if, if they can talk about it. Uh, the CARES Act, the savings and expenses, plus a few other things. One other thing that came to my attention and will have to be, as of now, okay, on our agenda. And it has to do with the presentation from H and H. So Brian Behe from the pension board, he contacted me and he to discuss the ADC as it was presented to us by H and H. And his concern was the new mortality rate that was voted on by the pension board, which that vote took place on February 26th. And if you if you take a look at the presentation, not now, but at some point, you know, go to page 12, go to page 13. There's two tables, okay? And the table on the right is the table that the pension board voted on to use. And we discussed this this that night with H and H. So that table represents the new mortality rate. It should be used, and, and you know, the vote was that they wanted. The, the new mortality rate to be used as our basis of discussion as to funding the total ADEC for the 2021 budget year. Now that difference is 1.8 million. So we took this vote, it was on the 26th, so it was late, and they, their intent was for the town to use that table, which is a difference of 1.8. All right, if you remember, h and said that 50% of the municipalities in Connecticut are using it. So he offered to come in and discuss this with us. Now, I don't want to deny him um, the opportunity to, to talk to us, you know, on his concerns. It doesn't mean we have to change anything. It doesn't mean we have to, to follow the recommendation, but it, it should be something that we listen to. And, you know, in the past, we have followed it as a board. All right. And I think H&H &A should be here also. So that's, that's what I'm asking. Uh, and I talked to Caitlin about it earlier to have H&H. &H. If Brian's going to be here, we want H&H &H here too. All right. Are there any questions on that? Mr. No. Matola? So that's great, but when are we, the nine of us, just going to start talking about this budget and what the heck we're going to do? Because I have, I kind of have ideas where some of you want to go. At, at some point, we have to have our own executive session, right? And without – I don't want to start talking about the budget, what we're going to do at 1030, quarter of 11 at night. That should start at 730 one night. That's that's all I'm throwing out there. So. I think we're going to need another meeting. That's all. 
Maybe so. You know, I kind of agree with you. Yeah, agree. But we want to listen to the Board of Ed, right? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I agree. And so, I mean, that could take a couple hours. And then, um, you know, Mr. Vey, he wants to talk to us about this mortality rate. And it's, it's, it's up to us and what we do with it. But I don't want to deny him the opportunity to come and explain it. I agree. Mm-hmm. So then that's on Tuesday. That's 5 5. So we can meet on 5 7? 7 would be Thursday, yeah. That's what I'm going to recommend. Because we're voting on the 11th, correct? Yeah. So that would be 8, 9, 10. That's a Monday. In a hurry, it's 12 o'clock, the witching hour. All right, so 5 5 7? <laughs> Five seven would would pretty much be the last day unless we want to. And the only thing we'll do that night is talk through the budget. Okay. Right. And then we vote on five eleven, and then we did our job. So, Caitlin, I'll talk to you tomorrow about uh, working with Jennifer on the um, agenda for five five and five seven. Okay. Okay. All right. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Charlton, I'll take the peace sign. Seconded by Mr. DeWitt. All those in favor? All right. Aye. It's unanimous. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. This-